All right, we're rolling, man. How you doing? Good, man. Good to see you. It's been I don't know how many years. I think yeah, I, four when Fozzie was on it. Yes, I was going to say about 2012. Uh, we I saw yeah. you uh, when Fozzie was on the Mayhem tour. So I guess we're looking at ten, wow, ten years ago. I didn't. I just can't believe it's been that long since. I, I know. It's amazing how fast time goes by. Yeah. yeah. So um, I know uh, I know you're super busy. Um, you know, just mm -hmm. just for uh, just for uh, purpose of getting the conversation rolling, just kind of tell me what you've been up to. <clears throat> well, as you know, I was a, a tour photographer, video video guy for a bunch of years, or close to twenty, actually twenty years, yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, you know, I did my last tour with a band called Five Finger Death Punch, and they kind of right. broke my they're they're you know uh, a couple dudes in that band are really cool but i, mm -hmm. I had to step away because i was approaching 50 years old at the time mm -hmm. and uh touring with them was just it, it was all the things you think about of a metal band as far as the sex drugs and rock and roll go wow. but i was kind of burnt out on it you know and yeah. uh it was a world tour seven weeks and ivan got arrested the singer on a uh and during sound waves in australia yeah so, i heard about that yeah booted off the the deal and had to rebook everything through virgin from Qantas, and we're banned from Qantas. oh and, my god uh, yeah yeah so by the time we got to singapore i i knew it was time for me to find another gig i was like I, i'm tired of touring yeah. i had moved to the bay area uh, to a beautiful place in marin county mm -hmm. uh, san rafael and it was I wasn't getting to enjoy it. You know, I was paying all that money and not, not living there and you know, mm -hmm. I was ready to move on. So by the time we got to Singapore, uh, I had made up my mind and I had recently seen a movie called 20 feet from stardom. Uh, yeah, I've, I've heard of it. I haven't seen it. I want to though. It's a masterpiece. Yeah. It won the Oscar the year that uh, it came out, but it gave me great inspiration for hired gun. You know, and that's where mm -hmm. I kind of, up with that idea and that's when i came up with the idea because i know i was done touring i'd saved up a little bit of money and we still had five weeks left to go in europe so i was just eager to get back to the states and hit the ground rolling so in that five weeks i just came up with a you know story outline synopsis uh called some of my rock star friends and mm -hmm. literally was home for just about a week to defrag and i started filming got it financed and uh have been making movies ever since that's great, man. I, when you said uh, I was already ready to be home and we still had five weeks to go in Europe, I mean that is that's a rough one when you don't want to be on the road and you still got five weeks to go. You know, that I think you, you could probably think you know relate to it as well. You know, as when and then when you're home, you can't wait to get back on the road after a little bit, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's always that thing. The first couple of weeks are, are awesome. Then you start looking at the tour book and like, man, how many more weeks do we have left before I get mm -hmm. to go home? And then you're home and everything stops. And, you know, I've talked to a few few guys and gals about it. It's kind of like, it's almost like PTSD. You know, if you're always hearing the bus engine go, the, the tractor trailers, you know, the mm -hmm. audience, the, there's just never a silent moment. When you finally get it, it, it fucks with you a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And especially, I mean, because the, the situations I was, in, I was touring in were always a lot more, uh, not so crazy you know i mean i i toured with right. people that didn't have those kind of issues you know i mean we didn't have people you know it, the sex drugs and rock and roll thing wasn't something that my touring experience really was a part of you know i mean um you know it was all pretty calm you know it was just the being away from home it was having a, a new family a son um and just having done it for so long you know, um, even though I never spent enormous times, enormous amounts of time at a time away from home, it was always a few weeks at a time with long breaks in between. It was just that cycle of always, you know, like, you know, a tour's coming up, a tour's coming up, a tour's coming right. up. And, and it just it makes it hard to just kind of uh, establish any kind of a, a normal life, which was something I was really starting to want, you know, like I um. I, I'm I've changed in a lot of ways now that I have a son and he's in school. I'm actually I never used to be a morning person. I'm actually a morning person now. You know, yeah. it's like it's not like getting up at 6 a.m. is is just, you know, it's not like I spring out of bed and, you know, like, oh, I'm, but I like 
I like having that routine. You know, I like, I like going to bed in my bed at night. I like getting up in my house in the morning, you know, and taking my son to school and going about that routine and, you know, always having that interrupted or always having to say, okay, I've got to get out of that mode and get in a whole other mode. Right. You know, and that switching between modes was just starting to wear on me. So, um, yeah, that's, that, you're right. You know, that's a, a downfall of this, end, you know, that industry touring, uh, is you miss out on, on your kids and family, you know, and my son's 31 years old and I missed a lot of precious time. You know, wow. I, re- I remember being on the road, uh, you know, I worked for a, a band called stained for mm-hmm. eight or nine years. Uh, and I, you know, he was playing, you know, peewee baseball or whatever. And I would have friends of mine that are at his games while I'm on tour, like FaceTime, mm. you know, or the was Skype or whatever it was back then. Yeah, like play by play. You know, he was in the actually made it to the championship game one year, and he he struck out to lose the whole thing. But I was there to, to at least listen to him. You know, right? But yeah, you know, it's, it's stuff like that. But uh, but a moment like that, you want to be there to be yeah. able to say, "Son, it's okay. These things right. happen. You got to pick yourself up, and you know, and and don't let it get you down. You know, you want to actually be physically in in their presence when those kind of things happen." A hundred percent. Yeah. You know, and, and lucky for me, we have a great relationship. He, uh, he now lives here. I, I live in Santa Monica now and he lives mm-hmm. a block away from me and uh, works for me. So I get to see nice. him every day and making up time. Yeah. That's great. I mean, you, um, you, so you had a kid when you were fairly young then if he's 31. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm 56. So I had him when I was like 24, 25 years old. Okay. I'm glad I did, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it, it's, it's been a blessing, man. He's, he's super oh, yeah. cool funny and loves loves movies thank god you know and yeah. always happens yeah i got him into that thing early so he works with you yeah he's a, an assistant editor and he's also been a camera guy you know since mm-hmm. he was really young i remember i was a camera operator on the slipknot duality video he must have been 13 and mm-hmm. roadrunner literally is like you know anybody that does b-roll stuff because we need to be i was like sure 13 he had a camera in his hand actually wow. shooting pretty good because I'd, I'd shown him you know how to frame a shot or whatnot so mm-hmm. yeah he shot all that stuff and then you know later on when he was about 17 or 18 i got a call from you may know danny nozelle uh mm-hmm. the tour manager he used to tour manage like slipknot and cold chamber but he wound up being dolly parton's like worldwide manager like her wow like, a manager not a tour manager i mean like the deal and he hired mm-hmm. me to do her uh live in london uh dvd that mm-hmm. we shot the arena in, in London. I've I've seen that actually. Yeah, so we that's really the, cool, man. Yeah, yeah. So Zach was in. You know, my son Zach was uh, one of the a camera operators up front. You know, shooting and uh, it was a great experience. It was the first time going overseas, and you know, and, and Dolly treated us really, really well. You know, I've heard that she is just an amazing person. Like she's like the yeah. nicest person to walk the earth. Is what I've heard. Let me tell you everything that you read about her. I've spent quite a bit of time with her, not just doing that, but also shoot a lot of her album covers and just do photography with her. But uh, everything you read about her is that, and she's Dolly Parton 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Like it's not a, it's not a thing. You know, so anytime I see her, I'll walk in at nine in the morning to start a photo shoot. Mm -hmm. She's all dolled up and just happy and ready. And she actually wore my ass out the last time we did a, I did a photo shoot. I did, uh, what was it called? Uh, Pure and simple, I think it was mm-hmm. called. Uh, was that one of her albums or something? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And we shot in her backyard. Mm-hmm. We started at nine o'clock, and by one, I was I was toast. You know, <laughs> you're, a lot of people don't understand if you're holding a camera with the, with the lenses we're using and stuff. It's probably four pounds. It doesn't sound yeah. like a lot. Doesn't when sound like a lot, but it adds up when you're holding it up the whole oh, man. Time. And it's all, I mean, she goes all day nonstop. She'll go change. You know, she goes, We well, think you got three or four good shots. Let me know. I'll go change. She changed 23 times. Wow. Literally. Yeah, man. Wow. It was, and we did that for two days. We did one thing outside, then we went. She's got a big compound in Nashville. We set up a studio in there. And then uh, we shot all day in there the next day. She's a she's just a workhorse, man, and just, just the coolest ever. That kind of drive amazes me because I don't have that kind of drive. I wish I did. You know, yeah. I've been around people who literally they have it's like they have no off switch. It's it's almost as if they don't get tired at all. No. They just 
I mean, they can just function and function and function. And I'm just like, that's amazing. Yeah. I got to think that's why she's so successful. Oh yeah. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. If I had that kind of drive, who knows, you know, any of us were, because those guys like, you know, who else is like that is Jason Newstead from Metallica. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was fortunate enough to work with him quite a bit when he did the Newstead metal record. Mm -hmm. And when I lived in the Bay area, he lived maybe 10, 12 miles over the, you know, on the, on the east side of the bay. But uh, I worked for him for close to a year as he was writing and recording the album. And I've mm-hmm. never seen it. He and Dolly are the two hardest working guys. And I'd say a third person would probably be Mike Mooshock, the guitarist for Stained. Okay. Yeah. I mean, when we're on the road, man, he's got the guitar in his hand in the bus. And mm-hmm. I don't know. It seems like Rich Ward may do that. I can just like a guitar always present. Yeah, always going over the licks and chops, and uh, and Mark Tremonti's the same way as well. Just yeah, never yeah. stop. Yeah. yeah, Rich is really driven like that. Chris is really driven like that. When we right. um when we did that Fozzie across America thing, where we did mm. the three three shows in three different time zones in one day. Oh, God. I remember reading about that. Yeah, I at the end of that, I was, I was, I had, I couldn't. I couldn't have like made myself do something. You know how it is when you're tired, but you can still find the reserves and and push through. Yeah. I hadn't, by the time we were done with that, after the third show in Vegas in the dressing room, I had literally nothing left. I was just like, I could barely keep my eyes. I was done. And, and Jericho had friends there and he was ready to go out on the town. He's like, come on, let's go. And I'm like, no way. I am. Cause I also knew that, you know, by the time we got to the hotel and, uh, I, I literally, we got to our hotel and you know how Vegas ho- hotels are. You check in and then you've got about a half, you know, you've got like a mile walk to get to your, to your anywhere. Yeah. yeah, anywhere. And um, so I like grabbed a quick shower and I had exactly an hour and 45 minutes before we had to be in the lobby to fly home. Oh my God. Yeah. And I was, yeah, I was just like, I'm done, man. I can't do it. So I, yeah. I've, I've been around people who have that kind of drive and it's just amazing. Um, I actually did a little bit of work uh, back in 2009, uh, no, excuse me, 2009 with uh, Wolf Hoffman, the guitar mm-hmm. player from Accept. And uh, yeah. yeah, he's a super nice guy. And um, I stayed with him at his house in Nashville for about a week uh, and um, doing some recording stuff. And he told me about, because he's a photographer as well, and he told me about doing uh, a photo shoot with Dolly Parton. And he was just talking about, you know, like, what a super nice person she was. And like, yeah, I, she's one of those people you probably could not find a, a human being on this earth to have a bad thing to say about, you know what I mean? So, you know, uh, the, the, the coolest thing she ever did was the, the first time I did her, her photo shoot for one of her albums, there was a, a film crew in there filming behind the scenes stuff for a music mm-hmm. video. She was going to put out just cutaway stuff mm-hmm. in the middle of doing the shoot. She just kind of stopped and looked at me. She goes, would you let me shave your head for a scene in this? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you know, I was like, of course. Yeah, exactly. absolutely. You know, and uh, she went out and got her PA or whatnot to go out and get a can of Barbasol and a Bic razor. And she literally shaved my head while it was being, it's in the music video. And, oh, wow. Uh, okay. I got to look that up. Yeah. If anybody wants to watch it, I think that the song is called change it. Mm-hmm. And it's on YouTube or whatever, but about the, minute and a half or two minute mark you'll tell me she said they're just whittling away at my head and face and everything else and it was it was That's definitely one of the highlights of my career it was uh, something silly but you know yeah. many people say the dolly shaved their head you exactly know? well you had, you were already shaving your head yourself at that point right you just yeah you, you know it was it was crazy because when i got the call it was a last minute call to come do this shoot i was actually on the road with stained we were in kansas city mm-hmm and, uh, and those guys are like family, even though Aaron and I politically would fight like cats and dogs. But Well, uh, we're going to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, that's yeah, why, yeah. You're, that's why I, you're here. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm ready, you know. It's not like I'm a super uh, political junkie, but I know what I, I like and what, I, what I'd like to see the country to look like or the world. That's, but, uh, I'm, the, I'm the same way. I'm not a political yeah. junkie at all, but, I, you know, I, I have um, I have strong opinions. And we'll, we'll get into that, but, sure. like, you know, finish your story. Yeah. About yeah, so I was, you know, in Kansas, and I get the call from uh, Dolly's people. are like, hey, could you be in Nashville tomorrow? She, you know, she'd like to do a photo shoot with you, and it's for a new album cover. And then, you know, Dolly does one photo shoot a year. <clears throat> so that's why she does so many wardrobe changes. So yeah, we'll she say, gets it all in one shot. 
one day and it's like if cosmopolitan or whoever calls or you know women's day there's a different look she doesn't have to get all you know dressed up every yeah. every other week for a photo shoot or whatever so we just knock it all out one day and then they service the photos to all those publications okay yeah that makes sense uh, yeah so you know and I don't get dressed up for anything unless it's like an award show or something, or I'm going to you know, Grammys or whatnot. I literally showed up at the, you know, I told the guys in Stained, and I was just like, Hey man, I got this great opportunity. And they're like, go, go make some extra money. You know? Mm -hmm. So I hopped on a flight, man. I was a little, I was in shorts, t-shirts and a flip flop meeting Dolly Parton to do this shoot. And she didn't mm -hmm. give a shit. You know I mean? Yeah. I think she liked it even more than being some pompous New York photographer or whatnot. Right. I could see that. Uh, yeah, yeah, and we just we just had a blast, you know. And that's when she was like, "Can I, can I shave your head?" I'm like, "A hundred percent, you can." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know. I'd and certainly it, let Dolly Parton shave my head for sure. Yeah, you and know? we had a, you know, we brought in a DJ for the second uh, album I shot, and uh, she got all dressed up in leather, you know, one of these crazy outfits. Mm -hmm. And I was like, somebody, you know, Judas Priest is my all time favorite band, so uh -huh. I was just like, somebody play, you know living after midnight and she was sitting there thrashing just having a blast while we we're doing the shoot and yeah i love how she says it takes a lot of money to look this cheap it's true man she, <laughs> she's definitely had some work you know what i mean but uh she's still just uh just irresistible yeah she seems to have a really great sense of humor and uh a self-deprecating sense of humor which is always appealing particularly in somebody who's as legendary as she is and uh i, I remember seeing footage of her um I think it's at the Glastonbury Festival in, yep. in, in Scotland and uh, several years ago. And just the idea of Dolly Parton, you know, at a festival in Scotland, you know, this little country girl, you know, um, from yeah. Tennessee, you know, and that like all these young people in Scotland, you know, know the songs and just I, I think that's and like I think Metallica was on the same bill or something. And just the idea yeah. of a fest, I, I, I'd like to see that more in the in the U.S., you know, a festival where Metallica and Dolly Parton could be on. The, I don't know if they were on the same day, but it's certainly the same festival, you know. Yeah, yeah. And there, I'd like know, to see more weird, of that in the States. Man. Yeah, I'm sure you played, you know, festivals overseas and here. And just the crowd in, in Europe is just 10 times more insane and just into it than here. Mm -hmm. It seems like we almost take it for granted here. I don't know. But I know anytime we go to like Download or the Rock and Rings or, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Uh, you're looking at 120,000 people going ape shit, you know, yeah. and here there's a lot of people there, even a priest. I want to go see priest Tuesday night here at the shrine auditorium in LA. Mm -hmm. There are people that were their arms crossed. I'm like, first of all, how disrespectful to the metal God. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And again, you're, you know, they're, they're busting out the Sentinel rock or you know, old classics from their first record and mm -hmm. standing around with their arms crossed. I'm like, this is nuts, man. You know, I know. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, I don't know what it is about the European audiences that that music, particularly heavy music, uh, seems to just mean so much more to them you right. know, than than it does to fans in the States. I mean, it's not like we haven't it's not like I don't enjoy when I was touring. It's not like I don't enjoy touring the States. It's not like we haven't had great crowds and things like that. Just generally speaking, it seems like the European crowds, it, it's just so much, it's more meaningful to them. And I, I remember that um, uh, particularly in Stuck Mojo, when we would get interviewed by European magazines and stuff, they were much more interested in what did you mean when you said this or what, you know, uh, the lyrics to this song say this, what do you mean by that? You know, whereas uh, American audiences don't really care as much about like what you're trying to say. Um, I think with heavy music in the States, I think it's just about the music, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, I don't want to say they have maybe high IQ over there compared to us, but I seem to think so because when I travel, I'm like, well, you can speak seven languages, you know, yeah, because they're too lazy to learn a language and a half, you yeah. Know? But um, well, I only I only speak one, so I can't. You know, you know I, I was born in Spain and I can't speak Spanish, so really? there you go. Wow, my yeah, my, yeah. my father was Spanish and I can't speak Spanish, so. No shit. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I was, I was born there. I lived there for five years before moving to the States. And mm -hmm. you know, I got bullied as a kid because I couldn't speak English. Like I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, I grew up in the, in the projects in Marietta, Georgia mm -hmm. uh, called the Boston homes. And I would get my ass beat almost every day, 
you know, because yeah. they're just fucking, it was crazy, man. It was government housing. Where and, was that in Marietta? Because I'm, I'm very familiar. I, I lived in Marietta for a long time, so I'm familiar. So if you go, you know, uh, maybe a mile north of the Big Chicken. <laughs> if anybody knows what the Big Chicken is. Yeah. Well, anybody yeah. anybody who's familiar with Georgia or you know Metro yeah, Atlanta yeah. should know what the Big Chicken is. Uh, you know where Roswell Street is. So if you go down mm-hmm. Roswell Street, uh, I think it's Atkins Road. You take a right, and then you're going to bump into the housing project. It's just like brick, you know, single story. Where is it in relation to Whitewater? Right across the street, basically. Really? Okay. Yeah, if you go, matter of fact, me and a couple of my buddies that I became friends with there used to sneak into Whitewater before they were open and just take a towel <laughs> and go down the like there's no water. You know, this was way back in the day. But yeah, no, just water. slide on the on the empty water slide just on a yeah, towel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was it was nuts. But uh, you know, it took me a long time to learn. I had a tutor and my mother is can only speak Spanish at the time. My father was really? American in the in the Navy. Mm. And uh, he got a job at Lockheed Martin is why we moved to to Georgia, and I have this crazy southern accent, mm-hmm. even though my name was Francisco Javier. You know, wow, yeah. So people are just like, You're, you're Spanish, you, you and they try to speak to me in Spanish. I'm like, Stop right there because I, you know, <laughs> I, I know the basics, right? It's like, Oh, you're Spanish, but that, 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 that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. exactly. Yeah, I'm like, No, I, I don't, I don't, you know. And my my girlfriend is, is you know, from Peru, so she's fluent and she still has an accent. She tries to speak to me. I'm like, no, if you're angry at me, you can scream at me in Spanish. But other than that, you know, I'm not going to understand what you're saying because I remember my mom being pissed when I was a kid doing stupid shit. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I finally learned how to how to speak. I just had to block it out like a mental block, mm-hmm. literally, because my mother was just, you know, if, if you listen to her English now, you would, it's hard to understand her. You know, it's kind of yeah. very. Spanish. My father, my father, like I said, he was from Spain. And oddly enough, his name was Francisco as well. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and uh, I like him already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He um he moved uh to the U.S. when he was uh I forget how old he was, but I mean he was he was growing. He was an adult. I think maybe maybe okay. he was even in his thirties, and um and so he spoke with a very very heavy. I mean he spoke English right. well, but he spoke with a very very heavy accent uh, his whole life. Um, and, you know, people would always say to me, it's like, oh, so do you two, you know, do you speak Spanish to each other? And I'm like, I never learned. I never learned yeah. Spanish. My wife, my wife is Irish and she speaks better Spanish than I do, <laughs> you know? So, Isn't that funny? yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd like, I'd like to learn. Um, but I just, I, I just never put in the effort to earn, to, to learn it. So I wonder why it is in the States they don't. I don't know, man. Like, you know, we went to dinner with a, a couple mm-hmm. last weekend and the, and the lady was uh, actually from Ukraine. She could speak five languages fluently, including English. Like I could understand her English really, really well. And I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. I, I it's, it's certainly, um, it's certainly appealing, you know, the idea of being able to speak five, you know, multiple languages fluently. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, maybe one of these days I'll, it could be a thing where Europe is just so condensed. That's part of it, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. And here in America, for you know, look, a lot of people haven't had the luxury we have of being you able know, to travel the world mm-hmm. you know, on somebody else's yeah. dime, especially. So yeah. Well, I mean, like be- you know, like flying flying from England to Spain, or flying from England to France, or flying from England to anywhere in Europe is a matter of an hour and a half flying time. You yeah. Know? And a lot of people cross over borders. There's a lot more border crossing, um, you know, not to, uh, br- you know, Bill Cosby talked about that in one of on his one of his early albums before, um, you know, he talked about the whole, you know, told Americans don't feel inferior because Europeans can speak so many languages because, you know, it's like a half hour drive or a two hour drive between one language to another. And the United States, right. you can drive for eight days and you won't run into another language. And, you just um, pick up a accent a southern one or yeah. you know, new york yeah. or boston yeah there's definitely something to be said for that so how did yeah. you get into photography oh man that's the you okay so you, you're probably old enough to remember metal edge magazine right of course yeah absolutely so, had the honor of being in it yeah yeah yeah. matter of fact i probably sold a couple of pictures of, of your old band mojo to them 
back in the day. I yeah, would not yeah. be surprised if our photographs in Metal Edge were your photographs. So. Yeah, yeah, I know there's a couple for sure. Uh, but early on, man, you know, I used to go to – I was a concert junkie when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And I would just sneak a camera in, right? There, there were no iPhones or, you know, portable cameras back then. And if you remember back in the day on the tickets, no cameras allowed. They were right. serious. They would take your shit and crush mm -hmm. it, right? Mm-hmm. I had an old Minolta X700 with one lens that was a zoom, right? Just mm -hmm. a shitty whatever camera. But I would break the camera down, stuff it in my pants, put the lens in my arm jacket or whatever, mm -hmm. and sneak it in and get as close to the stage. And I wasn't doing it to try to be a photographer. It was just for memories, you know? Of course, yeah. yeah. Uh, all these memories. So, you know, because you uh, had to do that to have the, you know, to be able to hold on to those memories back in the day. Yeah. There I were mean, no, yeah, that was it. Yeah. Nowadays, a band's on tour. It's like, oh, let me look it up on YouTube and see what the show looks like. And, you know, back, none of that. yeah, none yeah, of back that. Then this, you had to talking, do that. We're talking 87, 88. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So after doing it for a while, obviously, the more you do something, the better you get at it. And, right. uh, and I never really paid attention. I was just like, oh, cool, man. Alice Cooper, or Priest, the Scorpions or whoever, Motorhead. And uh, friends were telling me, man, you, you really have an eye. You know, and you just throw that away because just your friends telling you something, right? You don't really yeah. pay attention to it. Yeah. And then I, after, I, yeah. yeah. I know after, what you mean. I, yeah. But. So after a few more years, I started kind of realizing, I was like, okay, this is framed great. I'm learning more about the functions of the camera because I was, I never took a photography class or a film mm -hmm. class in my life. So it's just trial and error. And pretty yeah. soon I learned about shutter speeds and F-stops and everything else and became better, a better mm -hmm. photographer. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to send my, uh, then I made a portfolio with like a dozen of my best photos and they were really good photos. I'll pat myself on the back. And Man. I was, sent them, I sent them to everybody, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I got them sent back, you know, unsolicited material, not allowed. You must have an agent mm -hmm. or, you know, we're not, we don't staff photographers. We just contract them out. Right. You're just a free mm -hmm. agent. Except one. And it was metal edge magazine. The person I got the address from fucked up and gave me Jerry Miller, who was the editor at the time. They gave me mm -hmm. her address. <laughs> wow. But went to her house. And the next thing you know, and they don't tell you when they're going to purchase a photo from your license one or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I just got a, a thing called a picture purchase voucher in the mail saying, we're using this picture of Alice Cooper. It's going to be a quarter page on the cover of the magazine. And we're going to give you 250 bucks. Wow, and that's then, all. <laughs> That was it, man. Yeah, a lot of people think you get paid big, but I mean, I've shot for Rolling Stone before, and it's like you, you'd be surprised. That wow. wasn't, a, you know, so that was my foot in the door, mm. right? And then Jerry Miller, who was the editor, she passed away this past year. Uh, and she, oh, man. Uh, yeah, I got to give her credit because she, she really helped me out in my career. But after learning I'm from Atlanta, she got excited because in New York and LA, the photo passes are all gobbled up super fast, right? So they, mm -hmm. they only allow so many people. There's just a lot of competition. But in Atlanta, there's not that many people. You know, I think right. it's maybe me and one other guy, Rick. I can't remember his last name, but kind of a heavier guy, but a, a legend. Mm. And, uh, so the next thing you know, man, she's like, hey, can you do photo shoots? I'd never set up a, a, a light in my life. I didn't know what I was. I was like, of course I can, you know? So immediately. <laughs> That's what you do, man. You just say, yeah, of course I can. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And then you figure it out. Then you figure it out. That's the same. We'll talk about how I got into doing a uh, film too. A similar story. So I, I, I went out I was married at the time and I went and took a loan out for 30 grand and upgraded all my shit and bought studio lights. And I didn't tell the wife. Uh -oh. And she was so fucking livid with me for, for going out and spending all this money that we didn't have, you know, as a loan. I was like, Take I'll it make it a $30,000 loan. That's stout. man. Yeah. 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 So, you know, at the time I was just working menial jobs or whatever mm -hmm. and uh, selling a photograph or two to metal edge for a couple hundred bucks a piece was not the smartest thing in the world, but right. You know, uh, as a good buddy of mine, Ray Parker Jr., uh, we'll talk about him too. He's like, at that point, you got to burn the B plan down. And the B plan for me was not working in a warehouse for seven fifty an hour. My mm -hmm. A plan was to be a professional photographer and go all in, especially now that I had the opportunity to do session work, you know, because that mm -hmm. paid 
more money because now yeah. you're in front of the band taking pictures. And I think my f- very first shoot was with Pantera at the uh, International Ballroom. All right. Wow. Okay. I, I yeah. was. I, was that on? Uh, was that on vulgar vulgar display vulgar display of power tour? Yeah. Hey, I think Biohazard was with them. And oh, okay. Yeah. I saw. Sheets. I saw them when uh, White Zombie opened for them. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I think that might have been. Because I remember seeing White Zombie at the International Ballroom as well. Yeah, that might have been. It was right around 92. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably about it because that's when I really started turning the corner and wanted to really do this as a profession. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, I did the photo shoot with Pam. I had two minutes. And they were already doing, you know, Jaeger shots and Jack Daniels and flipping me the bird. (laughs) It it was wild, man. It was the craziest two minutes ever. I'm just shooting away. You know, and thankful I got to do it, man, because it was just such an honor to shoot them. Yeah. And uh, so that's kind of how I got my foot in that door. And then move forward about eight or nine years. I, I then had not even that long. You know, I went to my first NAM show mm-hmm. and I got to meet my my hero, who's Neil Zlozauer, who's Oh, yeah. You know, he's done all the Van Halen and everybody. Oh, yeah. And we took a liking to me, man, and, and told me some secrets. I'm like, how? how are you living? Because I'm not making any money doing this. He goes, well, what are you doing? I'm like, just shit for metal edge or hip parader. You know, then I, you know, Rolling Stone. Mm-hmm. Oh man, you got to get into the advertising photography for Gibson or Marshall or PV or mm-hmm. whoever. I'm like, That's where you make the money is in advertising. I'm like, Oh really? Mm. So I started doing that and he was right. The, the checks quadrupled in pay, you know? Wow. Yeah. And this was That's- back when, when instruments were selling still, you know, now yeah, I, yeah. I, I when there was there. a market for actual musical instruments. Yeah. And then I, I, I vividly really remember the WCW were doing a big thing at the Georgia Dome, right? One of their big fights or whatnot. Mm-hmm. And they hired uh, or they brought in Megadeth with, for Goldberg because they did the Universal Soldier soundtrack with Crush. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And Capitol Records had hired me mm. to a photo shoot with Goldberg with Megadeth backstage. And they were just going to service that as promotional stuff. And it, and it was another great payday. I mean, mm-hmm. it, was, it was one of those were staggering, like, Holy shit. This is, you know, not, not only record label money, but movie studio money too, because they were going to come in together and do this big promotion. So did the photo shoot. And I remember Goldberg came out shirtless, these white jeans and his buttons undone. Mm-hmm. And Dave Mustaine comes to me after the photo shoot. He's like, hey, man, he goes, uh, look through those photos. If you can see his button undone, do mm-hmm. not serve that photo. Keep it to the side. I don't want anybody to think there's any weirdness going on. I'm like, what does that even mean? Mm-hmm. You know, but the, the the thought of him with his button down and a picture with, oh, you know, probably thought he was homosexual. Uh, who knows? But that was okay. Great. So this was this was Mustaine telling you, kind of yeah. giving you the idea, like I don't want anybody thinking there could be anything funny going. On. Like you know, do I give him a hand job in the dress? You know, so it's like how sweet wow. to say. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Dave Mustaine. I mean, you, you almost expect him to say something stupid. Okay. And, yeah, <laughs> I don't know the guy, so you know. Oh yeah, no, he's 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 a weirdo. But uh, and and on the flip side, David Ellison, the bass player, is, I consider him one of my very dear close best friends we talk you know every other day probably oh great and, yeah and he was actually in town uh for the pre-show you know not not for that but he's here doing some business and we we met up but um anyway back then you know when you're shooting for public they want everything on slides not not photograph prints so mm-hmm. i'm shooting transparencies and it was a rush delivery type thing it was like do the shoot FedEx it to us tomorrow morning. Don't even develop it. Just send us the rolls. Mm. I was like, okay. I ignored everything Mustang because I, I just didn't have the capacity to, you know, it takes a couple of days in the lab to get those, those prints back mm. or the slides. So I shipped them off. <clears throat> All of a sudden the, the posters and every magazine, you know, it's in people magazine everywhere. There he is with his button undone. <laughs> yeah. So Megadeth played the tabernacle, <laughs> you know, a year mm-hmm. later, though, so, I'm at the show. I'm backstage, and Mustaine drags me in the dressing room. He goes, "Motherfucker, I told you, you know, don't do." Wow. It. I was like, "Hey, man, I was out of my control. What am I going to do?" You know, and it's like, 
if you think anybody thinks that you're a homosexual because you're standing next to Goldberg shirtless with his, you got serious issues. You need to seek help, you know? Yeah. 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 So he and I really didn't talk anymore after that, you know, and, uh, but I still remain close with, with, with Elson and it's just shit. stories like that, man, that you just, you, you know, especially as a kid from the projects myself and I, and I grew up listening to metal and, you know, if you remember the Metroplex in Atlanta. Oh like, yes. I saw Megadeth there on their very, the look at, you know, uh, killing is my business. Wow. Yeah, I was there. Yeah. So I was a fan from day one. I saw yeah. Anthrax there on, on among the living. At With the Tesla? Yes. I was there too. Wow. One of the that, violent shows I've ever seen in my life. That was my first, that was my first time getting in a pit. Cause really? Oh yes. God. You didn't break any bones. No, I, was, I, uh, I never, I, I, I always like, I'd been to the Metroplex once or twice. I think I actually yeah. saw the circle jerks at the Metroplex. Um, oh, wow. Be yeah. Because I, I don't know if this was the same thing, but I actually, um, have you, I, I mentioned this, I think on my last podcast, um, you ever heard of a band called the anti-heroes? Yep. They're an oi band. I yeah. actually recorded the drums on their very, very first demo. Like no, a sick, sure. yes, oh, sick, cool. like six song demo, and um, I think the band members were like all different at the time because this is like 1987, mm. and um, it's a long, it's a long story, but that was the first time going to the Metroplex was like hanging out with those guys, and I had long hair, and I was hanging out with a bunch of skinheads, you know, just right. like <laughs> terrified that I'm gonna get my ass kicked, and um, yeah. but like going into the Metroplex and watching, uh, like um, watching. Uh, the circle jerks and watching people dive off the balcony and everything. It was like, a, it was like in a movie, you know, I yeah, mean, the Metroplex, really you could have filmed bad. great scenes of that kind of chaos and mayhem at the Metroplex for sure. It's like, it's like fight club, right? Yes. It's, yes. It's so, you know, a funny story about the Metroplex too. a band I saw there with one of my best friends, Kevin Robinson, who still lives in Marietta. He, he and I would go to all the shows there. did not matter who it was. We'll just go. We saw the plasmatics. Oh my and, God. Yeah. And he got thrown into the air and came down and snapped his ankle, you know, broke, broke his foot. Uh, but, uh, yeah. So the, those were the kind of shows there. And I hold that place with, with fond memories, man, still to this day. Yeah. So, I, one of the worst things that we'll just, I'll just say this and then we'll move on. But one of the worst pit accidents I ever saw um, was at the 40 watt club. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the 40. Oh, watt club. Yeah. yeah, of course. I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> It was uh, follow for now. You remember follow for now, right? Yep. Yep. They, they were playing, and it was a it was a, ma I mean not massive because the place was small, but it was a it was a very very active pit. And right. I remember this guy dove off the stage, and it was like a it was a full on swan dive, you know, <laughs> into the crowd, and a hole opened up right when he was coming down, and oh, like. Oh. <laughs> yeah, people caught his they caught his legs but not his upper body. So he literally dove like he went face first on the floor in a full dive and I was just like oh my god. And I remember he got they like helped him up and all I could see was that like there was just a, a river of blood coming out of his nose and mouth and oh. And they, you know, kind of took him away. And I was just like, I was having such a good time until that happened. And then I was just like, oh, now I'm scared. Yeah, that I don't was want to this. It was just so horrific. I mean, I wasn't necessarily scared for myself, but just seeing that was like, oh, God, that was bad. You know, I remember when my son was five years old and I was, you know, in the thick of it with the photography, you know, on, on a paid level. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was off, sent off to Athens, Georgia as well to shoot uh, corn. Wow. It was corn, Limp Biscuit, and Helmet. And this was when Limp Biscuit, before their album even came out, they had a three-song cassette. And mm. I remember Fred Durst giving my son one at five. Right. So it was is this my at the forty watt club? No, 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 no. It was a, oh. it was like a civic center type thing there. I see. Okay. Yeah, and um, but it was my first, my son's very first concert was wow. Corn, Helmet, and Limp Biscuit. But we're backstage. I just finished my shoot with with Corn, and. I guess helmet had just come off stage, but the EMT guys brought this dude back. Same thing. Blood just looked like Carrie. And my son saw that and was like, we have to go into this now. You know, of course I say he got to sit on stage or whatnot while I was working. So he was safe, but that was his first concert experience was, was that. You know? Wow. 
my son's first concert experience was a Fozzy show. So, oh, that's uh, cool. you know, yeah. I want to say this before I forget. Sure. Forget this. I remember Fozzy. You, you know, and and Sterling McFadden was the publisher of Metal Edge, but they're also the publisher of this wrestling magazine, one of the bigger wrestling magazines. Mm-hmm. And I got a call from their their publisher or whatnot to go shoot Fozzy at the Strand Theater in Marietta, Georgia. Oh, okay, yeah, that was our first show. Yeah, it was, and I was there to cover it and did a little mini interview with uh, Chris. Okay, and that was when we were Fozzy Osborne. There you go. And it's mainly just covers, right? If I remember right. That uh, was all covers. I mean, yeah, that yeah, was, yeah, it was all covers. Yeah. 1999 first show. It was all covers and it was covers that we probably never even played again for the most part. So, yeah. 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 So I, I was there and got to photograph it and, and wow. uh, interview uh, Chris. It was, a, it was a cool experience. You know? I remember you being at a lot of stuff that I was involved in, you know, stuck mojo mm-hmm. shows and stuff like that. I, and I remember of course the, the mayhem tour. I didn't remember that you were at that, uh, that one particular show because, yeah. you know, f- at that time, Fran was always around, you know, it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, Fran's here shooting pictures, Fran's here, you know, doing a write up on the show or what have you. So, right, um, right. yeah, it doesn't, that's, that's so funny. I, I haven't thought about that show in a while. That was, a. Uh, that was a weird experience going on stage and doing those songs and just oh, like, yeah, you know, trying to do it. We were basically doing the uh, Steel Panther thing before they did it. So, yeah. And I'll tell you something else about the Strand Theater, man. It used to be a great concert venue mm. uh, in the in the early 80s leading up to whenever you guys probably played there. But my first show there, believe it or not, was Ramones. Oh, wow. And that was a super violent pit. Like, I'll, I'll bet. <laughs> completely insane yeah it was like the ramones and then from then you know you know blackfoot to, and i remember my first celebrity experience ever was with mm-hmm. blackfoot remember them or i'm sorry it was molly hatchet okay yeah i remember molly. black i remember hack uh, blackfoot i remember molly Hatchet. i wasn't like into those yeah. bands you know because i wasn't like i wasn't either but I, yeah. I was such a concert junkie and i could walk there from where i lived in the projects and go and it was like five bucks to go see these bands you yeah know, well so there you go group. but anyway molly hatchet there's you know the side door and the bus mm-hmm. and i had a dollar bill i was gonna try to get whoever the fuck i could their autograph and the guitar player i was like hey man we say he's like fuck you and he just walked onto the bus i'm like what <laughs> i immediately ate molly hatchet now oh you know? yeah I, yeah. yeah it's so it's it's so funny how when you're a kid you know you think that if you get to meet some band they're going to be um they're going to be just enchanted by the fact that this kid wants to meet them. You know, that's like, Oh, check it out, man. This, this kid wants to meet me. Well, of course I'm going to pay attention to you, you know, and they, you know, the same thing happened with Ingve Malmsteen. It was a fun, it was like the rising force tour. I think he opened up for ACDC or somebody, Mm -hmm. but I was out by the Omni, you know, and he walks out. I'm like, Ingve, and there's a fence. So you can't even Mm -hmm. get to him. I was like, can I get a picture of autograph? And, he didn't even look at me. He just reached in his pocket and like a fucking ninja star throws a guitar pick. It hits me in the chest. He wasn't even <laughs> looking at me. He's like, whoosh, whoosh, there you go. The I was like, Hey, at least I got this. I still wow. have. It. Yeah. That's, that's so funny. The one time I, well, I had that experience a couple times, but um, I, I met, uh, I went to see uh quiet riot and it was, it was Iron Maiden with quiet riot opening on a, on I was the, there um, at the Omni. Yeah. At the Omni. Yeah. It was, uh, yep. it was, um, peace of mind tour and yep. uh quiet riot was you know riding high on the success of metal health and and come on feel the noise and uh i remember i was with some friends and i was able to get us backstage i don't know how i mean we oh, were just wow. we were walking around like the promenade of the of the arena and i saw a door it was an elevator door you know just it, we went around kind of like the back of the arena where not many people were or nobody was we were just walking around and i saw an elevator door and i said let's go let's go jump on that elevator see where it takes us and i i press the button the door opens we walk on the elevator i hit down and we go down one floor the door opens up and we're backstage oh no <laughs> and i was just like what the hell and so we walked out and we were in this like kind of big area and it was kind of blocked off and there was a security guy who stopped us and was like hey guys no further but he didn't throw us out he just stopped us where we were and we right. were behind 
we were behind like a railing or something. And I saw Rudy Sarzo about, you know, 30, 40 yards away talking to somebody, you know, and I did that thing of just a kid. Hey, hey, Rudy. And he like turns around and waves. And I, I did like this. I said, come here, come here, come here. And he actually came walking over to us. And because yeah. I've heard I, I haven't I haven't met him, but I've heard he's one of those guys. that's just like super nice. You know, let me um, tell you, man, I, I consider Rudy a good friend now, too. You know, he was an hired gun. Mm-hmm. yeah exactly yeah that's right yeah we, we hit it off and he, he lived at the time i was living in calabasas california which is mm-hmm. a little northwest of where i'm living now i think and uh but anyway i would run into him at starbucks all the time after hired gun mm. you know and then I, I would ask him i was like hey man we're doing the world premiere of hired gun at uh south by southwest if i fly you in would you come do the q a of course you know and he's, he's kind of like david he just says yes to everything that, mm-hmm. that's that's not inappropriate or whatnot but uh just the sweetheart of a guy just mm. the the kindest person you ever want to meet just yeah. really a, a good wholesome person i've always heard that i'd like i'd really like to meet him because i've heard that, that that's what he's like and that it's a it's um it's evident in how he just responded to a bunch of teenage losers you know standing there oh. saying <laughs> you know come here come here come here and he came walking over and like you know, shook our hands and how you guys doing? And we're just like, you know, amazing right. show, blah, blah, blah. And you know, you know, just uh, being dorky teenagers, but he was so nice to us, you know? Yeah. I want to say this about Rudy too. When, when I interviewed him for hired gun, you know, he's one of those unique guys who hops, you know, just jumped to bigger bands. You know, he mm-hmm. was an Aussie's band, Blizzard of Oz. And then Randy died. Mm-hmm. I'm going to shut this door real quick. Cause they're done. No, no, go ahead. Do what you got to do. Uh, Come here, buddy. <laughs> Come on. I no no I'm it's gonna, fine. I, I it's, <laughs> it's taken but, uh, me it's taken me forever to learn to like turn my phone off when I'm doing stuff like this. Oh I know. Well yeah, so I'm in my audience, you know, I'm in a uh, one of my editing bays here at our offices. Mm-hmm. And uh the door is always shut, you know, if we're in here editing with a, our story producer or whatnot, it's just dark. There's no windows, the soundproof, unless the door is open, then you hear every fucking thing. <laughs> you know, it's like being a recording studio, basically. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm at Rudy's house. We're doing the interview for Hired Gun. And he's one of those unique guys who went from Ozzy's Blitters of Oz band with Randy Rhodes until he died. Mm-hmm. And then uh, after that, he went to White Snake. Mm. Right? Yeah. Or Quiet Riot. Maybe it was back in Quiet Riot, the original. With Kevin yeah, Eagle. well, yeah, Randy yeah. died, and then he went back to Quiet Riot, where they had Carlos Cavazzo and that. But then yeah. that's when Quiet Riot blew up. Exploded. Then he went to Whitesnake at their peak, right? Mm-hmm. And then yeah. after that, he went to Dio until the day he died. And uh, we're just getting a story down about what it took to maintain that, that level of success. Mm-hmm. And he kind of glazed by it. You know, a lot of people probably didn't know, but Rudy was on the bus when the plane that was mm. carrying Randy Rhodes hit the bus and burst into flames. So Rudy I read was that in his book. Yeah. Yeah. So he skipped over that whole thing. I'm sure it was really traumatic for him, mm. but it was kind of, if it wasn't for that, I mean, the trajectory of his career happened after that, I think. Mm-hmm. So I called him up. I'm like, Rudy, I was like, your, your story is so fascinating. And, and what we're cutting here, but, you know, kind of the reason you you left Ozzy's band was it was too traumatic to be on stage without your best friend, who was mm-hmm. Randy Rose. You know, now Brand Gillis has stepped into his shoes. Mm-hmm. And we never really talked about that. I was like, you know, and I really want to make you a center point of this film. I was like, would you be open to maybe sharing your story? And I know it's traumatic and I'm asking a lot from you, but I think it'd be really impactful and maybe even help some people along the way. And he's like, yeah sure let's do it when can you come over so we rearranged the time and you know we only talked about that you know i was like you know walk me through that day mm-hmm. you know and you could tell it was, it was very difficult for him to talk about he doesn't like talking about it yeah, i can but, imagine yeah but he you know we had a couple of cameras a very small crew that day and by the time he was done with the story we were just weeping like babies you know because he really felt it you could he was wearing it straight up on his sleeve and you could just see the pain in his face. And, you know, he was very close to Randy and, and he's, he gives all the praises and everything, but success to, uh, to Randy, mm, you yeah. know? And, uh, yeah. It, it was traumatizing. 
Wow. For all of us to hear, to even to hear it, it was, it was tough. But yeah, I can imagine it was probably somewhat therapeutic, though, for him to to get that off his chest and talk about you, it. You know what else was therapeutic was you know, uh, have you seen the film? I'm sorry to say I haven't, but okay. you know, I'm like tonight. I, I'm going to yeah, be yeah. watching. It was out, for the audience out there. You know, Netflix picked it up. They did a licensing agreement for a couple of years, and then Amazon Prime picked it up. So if anybody has Amazon Prime, you can rent it anywhere. But on, if you have Amazon Prime, it's free to watch. But uh, Jason Newsted's in the film too, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And Jason got his career started the same thing as a hired musician. He was not a member of Metallica for almost a year. Right. He was making five hundred bucks a week. Wow. So, yeah, five hundred bucks a week. He was like, I would have done it for a fucking sandwich, you know. Mm-hmm. All, he loved Metallica. Yeah. And after a while, they made him a, a full permanent member, and you know, splitting everything down the middle, you know, wow. from the time he arrived, not not the past album, but I mean, he's part of the the Black Album, Justice for All, Garage Days. He's doing very very well. He, he is not hurting. <laughs> yeah, but I can talk, imagine. Yeah, so he talks about leaving Metallica and how traumatic that was for him. That's on the bonus DVD. If you buy the, the the DVD, there's a bonus section about why he really left because there was a lot of misconceptions about why he left. Mm-hmm. It wasn't because of Echo Brain, the other band he wanted to do. It was because they were fried. You know, they were going mm-hmm. through divorces and all kinds oh, yeah. of weird. Shit. It was just their you know the management was not looking after their mental health. Right. You know, and after yeah. they, after the Black Album, he goes, we're just you know he he can't. He doesn't even know how many shows they did. It was just nonstop. I think it was a three-year tour cycle on that one record, nonstop. Yeah, wow. yeah. I can imagine, like, because a lot of people think it's all glamour and glitz, and and you know, I mean, a band like Metallica at the level that they're touring, obviously, are getting taken care of very well. You know, I mean, they're flying oh, yeah. on private jets. You know, they they're like, but it still wears on you. You know, yeah. like. There, it's not like it's just uh, it's not just fantasy wish fulfillment. It's still work, even though because you wouldn't be able to function if you weren't being taken care of at that level doing, you know, a three year tour cycle where it's just yeah. show out because just playing a show is very physically demanding. You know, it's a very yeah. physically demanding thing. And the travel is physically demanding. And you're talking about constantly dealing with different time zones and illnesses mm-hmm. and and you know different you know going from someplace where it's freezing to someplace where it's tropical you know at a constant pace all the time you know and yeah. and even when you're getting treated well and you're making money it's like the human body can only take so much and the human psyche can only take so much and it does yeah. frazzle you and yeah when I, yeah when i was working for the likes of like a nickelback or a stained you know mm-hmm. we were either flying most of the shows or even kiss. I did a little thing with kiss back in the day, but, uh, and then you're in, in tour buses with condo bunks and mm-hmm. with those bands, they each have their own bus, you know, wow. and I always had to ride with a member of the band because I was the photo guy I had to do stuff. So, I, you know, when I remember working with stained and we can turn political a little bit if you want, but I was, I was riding on Aaron Lewis's tour bus and he's, mm-hmm. if anybody knows Aaron, he's a staunch conservative to the level of like, a Ted Nugent or Donald Trump level. Right. Right. And, uh, I just started getting into politics after George Bush, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and now that I really, it wasn't really just was probably Dick Cheney that, that fucked everything up. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I remember saying we're recording a record and for my job, I would have to be in the studio with those guys mm-hmm. and the studio was an Aaron's backyard in a barn. And the barn used to be an art studio from the creator of the Ninja Turtles. So mm-hmm. it's this is ass space that they turned mm-hmm. into a recording studio. And I was living at Aaron's house. You know, he's got this gigantic 22,000 square foot home with a guest thing upstairs, but I would mm-hmm. eat dinner with the family every night. Mm-hmm. And he liked to push the button, you know, and I would mm-hmm. push it back. Right. <laughs> and it, it was cool because we were kind of family like that. Like we, we could scream at each other and I was not in fear of being fired or anything like that. Right. But, right. His wife would be like, "Really, you guys are going to start this at the fucking dinner table?" You know, <laughs> you know, and we just like go at each other constantly, and it was like that on the tour bus too. Mm-hmm. You know? And those guys don't get along. You know, it's a bit stained as a business. So mm, wow. Aaron had this bus, 
Mike Mushock and the and the two other guys had their own bus, and I was mm-hmm. riding with him, and he smokes on the bus, cigarettes and weed constantly, and I'm trying to. I've heard I that, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, man, I, I you know, and I finally had enough, you mm-hmm. know. And we were just at each other's throats constantly. So one on the on the other bus, the Mike, you know, Mike's bus, mm-hmm. who's still a dear friend, and we talk quite often as well. He's he's a good dude, and mm-hmm. I still talk to Aaron every now and then. He right. actually called me last week. But um, I, when I was like, I'm done, man. I can't take anymore. He goes, what are you talking about? Like, your fucking singer's a dick. He's just coming at me with, you know. He's like, what do you mean? This is it. I was like, I'm, I can't do this anymore. I'm flying home in the morning. He's like, wow. Why don't you just move your shit to our bus? What took you so long? <laughs> you know, I was like, what? He goes, just come over here with us, man. Don't leave. We'll, we'll treat you good. I'm like, are you sure? He's like, yeah, just bring your shit over here. I'm like, okay. Wow. So I rode that bus for five years and, you know, and then when they did the, the follow-up record, uh, their, their last one, they did their last studio record. I didn't stay at Aaron's house. I was just like, I'm, I'm going to rent a condo. I was making decent money. So I was like, I'll, I'll even pay for it, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I just rented a condo that was in between. They couldn't even record together. That's how dysfunctional this shit is. Wow. So there's, so Aaron would do all his vocals. Well, they kind of wrote the music together and then, mm-hmm shit hit the fan and Aaron was going to try to go country. And then yeah. he started with a political thing, just out, you know, just too outspoken probably for the band's taste. Mm. So Mushok would record all his stuff at a, at another makeshift studio that, that they built in Springfield mass. Mm. So for myself and Johnny K who was producing, we took the brunt of the, the abuse. Cause we had to like, stay with Aaron until two or three in the morning, whenever he decided to show up, you know, and mm-hmm. I don't fault for that because creativity happens when it happens. As you know. Yeah. Yeah. You force that. But Mike would want to record early in the morning when he dropped his kids off at 8, 8 a.m. Mm-hmm. and go three or four in the afternoon. So it was like, we weren't getting any sleep for seven or eight months, you know, during that cycle. And then that was the end of the band. You know, they, they fired the drummer. Uh, mm-hmm. Mike, uh, Don Wasaki had been there for 17 years and it, it was, it was a tough record, man. And it was tough seeing like your, 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 your kind of your family go through a breakup like that. Just so much animosity. And what and year was this? Uh, 2012 or 13, I think. Okay. So when, when they were doing, uh, when they were doing mayhem, I mean, uproar and we were on there as well. Cause Stan was that? that was, yeah. That what time. year was that? That was yeah. 2012. Yeah, so it was 2012. Yeah, and I remember the first show back without the original drummer was at Rock on the Range. Mm. And Will Hunt filled in for a few shows until they got a permanent drummer. And mm. uh, it was just weird seeing that, man. I mean, the, the guy filled Wasaki's shoes okay, but it was just strange. Because for mm. so many years, I'm used to seeing my, my, my friend, John, up there, and uh, he's not there anymore, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 We'll, we'll use that to kind of segue into, you know, the, I, I don't want to say political, but the, the philosophical stuff. It, this whole conversation makes me think of um, the thing that kind of fascinates me is like here you and I can sit and have, I mean, we've been talking for almost an hour now about anything but politics, anything, you know, and, you know, we could talk for hours more about these things. We have so much in common you know, mm-hmm. like in our tastes and the and the way we see things in, you know, like in the music world, you know, we could go on and on and on. And yet when it comes like and you like like you said with you and Aaron, you said that you guys were, you know, you guys were friends. You obviously had some, you know, a lot in common, but except for that, you know. And that is one of those things that's so it, it's so uh, you know, I guess I, I can't think of the right word pertinent. It's like so uh prevalent. It, it strikes me as funny as how two people can like have a conversation like you and I have been having. And then when it gets to something like politics, we could diverge. Completely. <laughs> you know, it's funny because when I talk, you know, Aaron called me about a week ago, just out of the blue. Hey man, what are you doing? You fucking commie. I'm like, really? Here you go. There. I haven't talked to you in a month and a half. Two months. You're going to call me a commie. He goes, why don't you move out of that fucking cesspool of California and move to Nashville or Texas and save some money. I'm like, first of all, I live in California for a reason, mm-hmm. right? I like mm-hmm. the political climate here. Mm-hmm. I love the weather, you know. That's I, an I, easy I, one. Yeah, there's a lot to love here. Do, do I love the outrageous prices? Not really, but you kind of get what you pay for, you know. Mm-hmm. Roads are great. 
you mm-hmm. know, we, we pay extra, have nice roads. Mm-hmm. Um, and while in the Bay Area, I, I, I will admit it was a little weird because downtown San Francisco is a, a shithole. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's so much tech money there, you know. Yeah. Especially at the time that I was living there, maybe three or four years ago, it was a tech boom. And they were just buying up everything and just squeezing everybody out. And where I, where I picked to live in the North Bay is a, is a county called Marin County. It's the most expensive real estate in America, like more mm-hmm. than Manhattan, anything. I, did, I didn't really know. I was just, you know, renting a house in Lagunitas, mm-hmm. where they made the Lagunitas Brewing Company. Mm-hmm. And it's beautiful out there. It's just in the woods. It's, it's just surreal. But as I started getting closer into like San Rafael, I was just like, wow, that's four forty five hundred bucks for a one bedroom apartment. You know, that wow. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was just like, wow, shit, man. You know, I hope this movie does well. You know, <laughs> yeah. this gives you on your toes. So, you know, I lived there for about 11 years. Uh, and then I moved to Los Angeles just because I had to for work. It was just, mm-hmm. I was flying back and forth. I mean, it's only a 45 minute flight, but. Yeah, doing it twice a week just didn't make any sense, you know. And it's, mm. it's much cheaper, believe it or not, here in Los Angeles, even in Santa Monica, you know. And uh, I just bought a home in Calabasas, which uh, was sticker shock because, um, for whatever reason, the market is through the roof. There's not enough. There's, there's just I can tell you firsthand knowledge. I've been looking for a house for three, four months. Mm. There's nothing available for what I'm looking for, you know, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I would put a, I got outbid three or four times by hundreds of thousands of dollars, not by 10,000 or 30. We're talking three, 400 grand outbid. Yeah. And this is all, all this is like completely (laughs) alien to me because like, I mean, the idea of living at that level is just so, you know, I, I, I'm a very, uh, I, I'm what you would call the, I, I belong to what you would call the working poor. You know, I mean, it's like, I, I mean, seriously though, I mean, like I never have made very much money in my life, you know, and you know what, I I didn't make much money Mm -hmm. until I got out of the, well, I was making really good money touring with some of the bigger bands, you know, like Mm -hmm. six figures, which I would consider from where I came from really good money and enough to sustain this. But uh, where I am now, that's really good money. Yeah, it's like I. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I couldn't yeah. even imagine that. Yeah, but go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So when when I got in the film and television world, you know, it's just you're just kind of like, it's the same game. You know how mm-hmm. record labels try to fuck you and just kind of like red tape the shit out of you. It's the same mm-hmm. thing in the film world. Yeah. You just gotta know how to play your cards and, and get the money up front, right? Because everybody wants to give you the back end of something. You'll mm-hmm. never. Matter of fact, Queen, the Bohemian Rhapsody movie, is made over a billion dollars. Mm-hmm. Brian May and, and the band have not seen a penny because they were promised like five or six percent of the back end. You mean to tell me this this the movie probably cost 150 million to make? Yeah. And I understand they gave them the music rights, right? Like Queen. Wow. Like, we're not gonna make you pay for the or we'll give you a deep discount for the you know, for the people that don't know in in film and, and television. You have to license the music. And that was something that was a hard reality when I did Hired Gun because we licensed like 90 giant songs from Pink to Alice Cooper to Kiss and yeah. Joel. But you have to pay for that. Mm-hmm. Not only you have to pay for it, you have to pay for two pieces of the music. There's the publishing side, which you know what it is. Mm-hmm. It's a songwriter share, the copyright. Mm-hmm. And then there's the master side that belongs to the record label. So you have mm-hmm. to pay for, for each one of those separately. Mm-hmm. And pray to God they give you a good a good deal on it. And lucky for yeah. me, I've really good music supervisor so you know it's just it's learning about all that and and as you become an adult especially for me i learn what not to do with my money and what to do with it and Mm. uh you know i invested in the stock market which i learned from a a dear friend of mine i didn't know anything about it And and i had saved money over the years it was just sitting in my bank account losing money he was telling us, man, every day that you keep your money, that amount of money in the bank, you're just losing because, you know, inflation goes up, the dollar doesn't. You know? Yeah, yeah. He goes, how much can you stomach to lose? Like if mm-hmm. you're just going to go to Vegas of all this money. And I, I gave him an amount. And we opened up what's called a, a TD Ameritrade app. Right? Mm-hmm. Got, you put your money in there, swipe it in. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I'll just tell you, I put 35 grand in there. I was like, mm-hmm. if I lose, 
this, you know, it'll suck, but I'm not going to go homeless. So mm-hmm. put their in there. That was in, in August. So November is that by, by April of that year, the money had quadrupled without touching it. Yeah. You know, it was, it was, and it was all tech stuff. It was Tesla, Nvidia, uh, Apple, you know, and since then I've put in a lot more money and, and I, I don't look at it anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was talking to a buddy of mine is uh, Derek Wembley from uh, some 41 used to live right down the road and we'd hang out. Mm-hmm. And like, he goes, I can't look at it, man. I just keep it in there. Maybe once a year when I talk to my business manager, we'll go over shit that I used to look mm-hmm. at it excessively like mm-hmm. I did. Mm-hmm. And I would panic. I'm like, wait a minute, Tesla stock was just a thousand dollars. Now 700. I just lost all this fucking money, but then it kind of just comes back up. Yeah. And yeah. if you look at the five yard, five year chart, you see which ones keep climbing and there'll be a little dip and it always goes back up. And that's Apple, Tesla, Nvidia. Mm. Um, I forget what else I've, you know, I've probably gotten a dozen different places, but I always choose the ones where the over a five year period is always going up mm. and uh, very well for me. You know. My my problem financially is that I've never been good at focusing. I, I, I was never good at playing the long game in, in yeah. that yeah, I, man. I, I was always focused on the next paycheck. You know, I was always focused on spending my time, you know, pursuing what's going to like pay the bills that are right in front of me, you know, right. And I was never good at just taking that little bit and setting it aside and then it's, investing. And I, I understand theoretically and conceptually investing and and all those things. But I never had somebody who kind of like and, and this is not to say, you know, poor me, you had an advantage. I didn't. But you kind right. of had somebody who somewhat held your hand a little bit and, and guided Absolutely. you through it. And yeah. I never I never had that. I mean, I had people tell me I've had people give me some, you know, some broad advice like, well, you know, you know, you should, you need to start, you know, and you need to diversify and you need to do this, that, and the other thing. But I never had somebody kind of say, okay, listen, give me your hand, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to lead you through this, you know? And, and so, but the one thing is, is, I mean, I'm starting to play, I'm a little old to start playing the long game, but you got to, you know, if you haven't started, you got to start. And it was only two years for me, man, two years ago. You know, yeah. I'm 56 or 54. I mean, I had a good chunk of change in the bank, but it was not doing anything for me. It wasn't making me, mm-hmm. you know, wealth creates more wealth, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, it, I had enough money where I wasn't wasn't losing sleep. I remember those days like you, man, just not long ago. I mean, just 10 years ago, like, I'm off the road now. When's my next paycheck coming? You mm-hmm. know, and, and it's desperation almost. Like, you just feel that. And I don't like that feeling, man. It was terrible. So yeah. I'm so thankful that, you know, and it was actually Ray Parker Jr., that mm-hmm. I did this, this. We'll talk about this movie later, but he's the one that kind of held my hand, and, and he made most of his wealth, believe it or not. He had made he was a millionaire since he was twenty two. He's sixty seven now, but he said he made eighty percent of his fortune in the stock market. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah. uh, he taught me all about it, man. He sat me in his backyard one day, and he's just a good dude. You know, mm-hmm. he's like, he goes, "Man, why, why, why is your why is all this money just sitting in your bank?" You know. Mm-hmm. And he's the one who's just like, how much can you stomach to lose? You know, it's like, well, it would suck tremendously, but, you know, I could lose 35 grand maybe. It's like, well, let's just do this. And he goes, if you put 25 grand in, you can do what's called day trading. So I had to upper hand there so I could do like, you know, wake up in the morning. Is you got to get up at four in the morning to play this game. You mm-hmm. know, because you can get Tesla, you, you can make thousands of dollars a day, you know, or lose a couple of thousand, but... You know, right, if you're smart right. and, and just set your limits because you can preset. So if I want to buy Tesla low at like, let's just say a hundred bucks mm-hmm. and then during the day, sometime it gets up to 125. You can have a sell mm-hmm. preset. Yeah. And as soon as it hits 120, it's sold and you've made 25 bucks. Yeah. That's I, I I've heard that before and I've looked, you know, I've, I've done some reading and some listening on investing and I just never, you know, like, I mean, I've never in my life, had a had a time where I had twenty five or thirty five thousand that I could risk. I mean, right. like, that's not everybody you know, does, man. I was very yeah. fortunate and and just kind of saved, you know. Well, and you also, I mean, good for you that you yeah. you know came from nothing and bootstrapped your way 
into that situation, man, I have, yeah, I have yeah. nothing but admiration for that. And, um, right. and part of the reason that I had to uh, move away from Fozzie was the fact that I was, I had, I, I've told the story before, I've kind of allowed myself to fall into a trap of, of depending on, and first of all, I am not, mm-hmm. I, I'm kind of a closed off person. I don't make friends easily. I'm not one of those people that has like a large network of close friends, you know, and right. in the music business to, you know, to, to, to get ahead in the music business, you have to be the guy who's willing to kind of go hang out and, you know, like and network or whatever. network and, and go have fun with people. And I was yeah. always the guy that as soon as the show was over, I wanted privacy. I wanted yeah. to go to my bunk right. and like hang out with myself. You know, I was never, a, a hangout guy and you know that's where the gigs come from man is like when the two you know when you're touring with some band and like you're in the opening band and they're in the headliner and you're hanging out with them and you're having drinks and they say you know what i know so and so needs a drummer you know that's how you know, this that's, that's funny you say that because that's how you know the hired gun world works yeah and all the guys i interviewed uh say the same thing is it's more about the hang than it is about how good you are. I mean, of course yes. you got a, a great musician, but the hang is so important because if you get a cancer into that camp, mm-hmm. you're in closed quarters, man, in a tour bus with sometimes 10, 12, 15 people. And that's one of the things I was always afraid of, like, cause yeah. I contemplated going out on my own for a long time. But mm-hmm. those stories, like you said, of like the Aaron Lewis thing, where he's smoking the bus up all the time, that's, See, that's the thing is like that kind of thing I thought of as being just completely intolerable. I was like, I could not be on a bus with a bunch of people that I couldn't stand being around. I mean, yeah. it would just be too and miserable. Being a, yeah. And being a free agent like we are, you're right. Your income is tied to one person. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fozzie, yeah. My, mine now is like the, the Sony pictures or the Netflixes of the world. It's like. They they control everything, man, and it's like you got to walk that fine line and and know know where how far you can go because they're not family. Right. I can't call it an executive at Netflix or Sony and say fuck you, man. I, I don't like the way you're doing this. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. Job. And as you know, also bad news travels way quicker than good news. You know, absolutely. And uh, you know, so and I don't think I have a hot head, but. You know, when you're creating something, just like if you create a song, mm-hmm. like for these films I make, I have to, they're not brought to me. You know, I, I conceive them. I get, mm-hmm. I get personally fine. I'd, I've never taken studio money before. I've always mm-hmm. just sold it to the studio after it's done. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't have that, that uh, leverage yet. You know, now, now I have a little bit more leverage, but uh, you know, when I, when I thought of the di- idea for hired gun, I, I financed the first hundred grand of it. Just, wow. And I went out without a parachute, man. I'm like, quit touring, which was paying me very well. Mm-hmm. And landed back in California and picked up a camera. Like, I went and bought the best cinema camera you can buy. Was the, back in the time, it was the, the red cameras. Mm-hmm. That was another $80,000 with everything. But I bought it because I didn't want to go rent the thing. And I could rent mm-hmm. it out, you know, and make money on it as well. But mm-hmm. I was beating financially for the first two years of hired gun because I was, you know, it was all me. Yeah. And then I found a financier, you know, and the, and the trick to that is, and he won't, he'll probably watch this and not give a shit, but you know, people with billions of dollars or, or hundreds of millions mm-hmm. that are in the oil business or the financial sector, they're just pushing numbers or drilling oil. They, they don't get, you know, they would dream of meeting, a famous celebrity like an Alice Cooper or pink or somebody. So yeah, they'll pay you handsomely, you know, to do this and get your movie made. So I needed a million dollars to get a hired gun made. And this guy was like, if I give you a million dollars, I get to meet Derek St. Holmes. And Derek St. Holmes <laughs> for a million dollars. I mean, no offense to him, but damn, for a million dollars. <laughs> I know his favorite guy is Ted Nugent, Alice Cooper. And he's another crazy co- he was at the Capitol building on, on the 6th when the shit hit the fan. Who he this? wasn't in there. His name's Todd Poulton. He's, he's like a brother to me, man. Uh-huh. But he's the guy, the, guy who gave you, the guy who gave you a million dollars to meet Derek St. Holmes? Well, to, to finance hired gun. Not to, oh, not okay. To, yeah, so he's like, I'll finance a movie. 
well, if I get the opportunity, can I meet Derek St. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. And Alice Cooper. I'm like, man, you give me a million dollars, I'll introduce you to the fucking Pope, you know, whatever. <laughs> so he did it. And we, and, you know, I got him to meet Alice Cooper. You know, I called his people. I'm like, hey, man, the guy that find, you know, I interviewed Alice for the movie, which was a treat. Mm. And uh, he got to meet Alice Cooper. And then uh, you haven't seen the film yet, but we did a, a jam at East West Studios. So mm -hmm. I rented the studio for a weekend and I had like 20 of the cast come in. We're talking the best musicians on the planet all get together and jam and Derek St. Holmes was there. And a lot of people don't know, but he's the voice of Ted Nugent on a majority of the hits. Yeah, the yeah, 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 exactly. All those songs. So he came in and did a whip ass version of uh, just what the doctor ordered with an all-star mm -hmm. band of Kenny Aronoff playing drums and felt like on guitar and, it was awesome. Man. It was a, a sight to behold. And uh, anyway, I got to invite Todd, man. And it made my day. You know, I wanted to see because he's a good friend of mine. And he was almost in tears and just as giddy as you could get, man, just hanging out with all these. Brad Gillis was there. And, you know, it was just. Wow. He was in hog heaven, man. That that made my day more than than the experience of me filming it. To be honest. Yeah, well, that's that. It's a really good feeling when you can do something like that for somebody. You know, yeah. I mean, somebody has. A, you know, somebody has a dream like that and you yeah. think to you and you get a chance to say, well, like I could, you got a dream. I could make that come true for you. You know, it's like, who wouldn't want to do that? Yeah. And his wife actually called me about a week later in, in tears. She goes, I just want to thank you for coming into Todd's life and introducing him to all these people that he's now friends with. Oh, that's, so now he's awesome. to see, you know, everybody and they know who he is. And he's just, a, just a cool hang other than his po politics. But uh, <laughs> he was there on Jan he was there yeah, on January you know, like, 6th. He called me goes, the Patriots are rushing. I was like, the Patriots? These are oh, treasonous man. motherfuckers, man. Like, uh, well, we might as well. Like, yeah, <laughs> we so might as well. Go. In. Yeah. <laughs> we might as well dive in, man. I, yeah. Um, So I'll just kind of give you my, you know, general uh, way I think about these things is that I look at it this way. I don't mm. know anything. And right. I kind of, I'm a, I'm kind of of the mind that no one really knows anything. And I'm not talking even just po political. I'm talking about, you know, anything, reality, science, the nature of the world. To me, I look at it as this reality is far too complex for mm. us to understand fully. Right. So, right. We don't, none of us knows anything. If, and if I say something in the, in the midst of a conversation about politics, if I found, if I sound like I'm declaring something to be true, the caveat is, is like, no, this is what I believe to be true. You know, this is my mm -hmm. opinion. This is what makes sense to me. I could be wrong. Anything I say that, like, if I say this happened on this date or this person, you know, passed this legislation or this person said this, it's always with the caveat that I could be wrong, you know? Um, and so that's why that, that's one of the things that like, I consider myself ph philosophically a libertarian. Um, mm -hmm. I don't like to hang labels around, you know, I don't like to hang a sign around my neck that says libertarian or this is Republican or this is any of those things. I mean, I think those labels are useful in, in, you know, in discussing things, but my, my philosophy is generally libertarian because it's like, I don't. I certainly, as much as I don't know, which is everything, I certainly don't know how to tell anybody else to live. You know, it's like, sure. I've got no, I've got no, uh, I've got no business telling anybody you need to do this or you need to do that. That's why I default to your life is yours, man. Your life is yours. It's your responsibility. Um, and I want the same courtesy. Allow me to make my same mistakes. I mean, I've made any number of mistakes in my life, you know, most of them, I yeah, most are my fault. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a flawed person and I do my best to take responsibility for everything, all my decisions, you know, good right. ones, bad ones, whatever. And so, and I think that's a, I think it's kind of the proper way to be. And so keeping that in mind when it comes to the political world, it's like, how do you, you know, what, what, what politics is the best politics to have that allows people to live to the greatest degree 
the way they want to without, you know, interfering with other people's politics or uh, just other people's lives. You know, the non-aggression principle, it's like, listen, right. you know, you do you, I'll do me. If we want to interact, we'll negotiate an interaction. But, but beyond that, you know, we don't have to interact if we don't want to. And I've always found, or not always found, but generally speaking over the last 25 years or so have found that politically the Republican party as flawed as it is and as flawed as anybody in the party is, is a, is a better representation of that point of view than, than the other party. Um, you know, I know there are, I know there are Democrats out there who consider themselves libertarian. You know, there's Republicans who consider themselves libertarian. Um, that might not have always been the case. Cause I think things change. I think early uh, you know, maybe in the middle 20th century, the, the, the Republican Party was more the party of order um, and that there was a it was necessary for uh, for the Democratic Party to inject chaos into that order because order was too too restrictive. And maybe I would have been a Democrat, you know, if I was the same age I am now in the in the 50s or 60s. But I think things have changed. Mm -hmm. um, so so I tend to be a Republican, you know, although I don't. I don't like a lot of, you know, there's a lot about the Republican party. I don't like, but, um, fuck you, that, Frank. I cut this off now, man. I can't do it. No, no, I hear you. You know, there, there's a couple of issues that I, that I stake my fork in the ground and, and mm -hmm. feel strong about one of them is healthcare. Uh -huh. I, I, I think that healthcare should be, uh, a right mm -hmm. for, every American, just like it is everywhere else. I understand that there's lobbyists out there and certainly these politicians are making money off of it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things I questioned was like when these vaccines came into, into play, like you're going to vaccinate 300 million people three times. Who's mm -hmm. paying for this? And how much are we paying? Right. You know, those are my questions. And I still don't know, like nobody's right. ever told us, but I can tell you, I went and got all three shots. It didn't mm -hmm. cost me a penny, right. which I'm grateful for, you know, and I did, you know, I haven't told that many people, but I got, I, I contracted COVID mm -hmm. uh, about six weeks ago mm -hmm. and I was really, really sick for mm -hmm. two days. Like a sickness I've never felt before. I don't know. Have you, have you had it yet? I, I have. Yeah. And uh, I had just the opposite experience. It was nothing. Yeah. So, and it affects everybody differently. It, it mm -hmm. seems, you know, again, I'm not a scientist. I don't know. Right. But it, it affected me. It fucked me up. Um, it was like a mega flu for, mm -hmm. for two days. So, you know, I started feeling like this cough or whatnot. And this is my doctor telling me, you know, who, who is a scientist to some mm -hmm. degree, had you not been triple vaccinated, you would have certainly been in the hospital on oxygen. Mm -hmm. You're that fucked up, you know, and they gave me a cocktail of medicines, you know, the next day, uh, a steroid, mm -hmm. a Z-pack, which every musician knows about, mm -hmm. uh, because my body's fighting this virus is leaving other things susceptible where I could get a, a bacterial infection or pneumonia or something. So she gave me a Z pack mm -hmm. and then hail her because the, the cough was just, it was just relentless, high fever, chills, the worst body aches I've ever had, probably the worst migraine I've ever had mm. hit me that Tuesday night, all, all symptoms at one time. And that's when I thought I was going to have to go in the hospital because I, I just couldn't stop, you know, mm. And, uh, you know, do the vaccines, well, I don't know, man, that, that's the question, but I'm not mm -hmm. going to fight it. I'm not right. dead. I can't mm -hmm. imagine the government wanting to kill 300 million people. No, it's, I don't No, I don't, I don't. You know, it's just like, it's gotta be somewhere. And Donald Trump is the one that started with operation warp, whatever warp speed. And, and I'm grateful for it. You know, mm -hmm. as much as I do not, I despise that man, even just as a human being, let alone a president. Mm -hmm. um, I'm grateful that he's, he jump started, you know, cause, uh, otherwise my doctor is telling me that I trust that, I, that I've been going to for years so that I, I would have been fucked, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's where, you know, it's just where, and you know, look, man, insurance, as you know, is a, unless your wife works and you get insurance, but man, you know, I'm, I'm paying almost you know, 1200 bucks a month for good insurance. Mm -hmm. that's catastrophic. Like if, you know, there's different mm -hmm. tiers, you can get the shitty insurance and then you got the insane deductibles. Mm -hmm. Why? 
Why? Yeah. You know, if we care for mankind, why aren't we just taking care of each other? That's, I don't understand that part, you know? Okay. Well, here's the way I would look at that. Um, so when you said that you believe that healthcare is a right, you know, mm -hmm. I disagree. And because I look at it as, first of all, that's a, that's a philosophical statement. So we'll, we'll get, sure. you know, for now we'll set aside vaccinations, uh, costs, all those things. Um, I don't believe that healthcare is a right because I, for one thing, I don't believe that we, we determine what are rights and what aren't rights. What we do, I think, is that we recognize what are rights, you know, uh, first of all, I don't think anything can be a right that imposes a cost on somebody else. So why is there I, a cost? Well, healthcare, you know, medicine, you know, going to studying to become a doctor, all those things have a cost. I mean, well, of they, course. You, you, you might. Well, OK, that's what I'm saying is like I, I'll, I'll put it this way. Philosophically, I don't believe that anyone, any person has a right to a dime of anyone else's money, a second of anyone else's time or an ounce of anyone else's effort. Now. Healthcare, in terms of what you want to do for yourself is just like anything else. Anything you want to do for yourself, you should have a right to do if you want to, you know, if you want to treat yourself for something, of course you have that right, you know, so in that way you have a right to healthcare, but you don't have a right to, and demand is kind of a harsh word, but when you say something is a right, you're making a demand on somebody. Like if you go to a doctor and say, you know, treat me, I have a right to healthcare. It doesn't, it doesn't work. You can't make demands on people, you know, for, for their money or their time or their that's effort. I think that's what's wrong with then society then, because I don't want to see you or your child suffer. Like God forbid. I don't want to see anybody suffer. I, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. People but, are suffering because they can't afford the treatments. There's treatments. I, like, forget a cold or COVID. Imagine you get pancreatic cancer. Mm hmm Worst thing that you can imaginably happen to you and you can't afford the, uh, that's catastrophic shit. You yeah, know? I know. Well, that insurance that you're, you're, you know, and a lot of people aren't as fortunate as you or I that are living in deep poverty, right? That are going to suffer harshly. You know, I don't want to see that. I, am I willing to, to pay a little extra? I don't think I should have to. I think right. it should just, you know, and when I say right, I'm not like, Oh, this is for free. There should be a limit like drugs, for instance, like a, a drug that would cost 200 bucks a month here in Canada or in Europe, mm -hmm. pennies on the dollar. Why? It's greed. But should well, greed take over somebody's well-being? We should look after each other, not just in America, globally, like, you know, yeah. so to me, we share this world together. It's not, not just America, you know, America or whatever. And, yeah kill anybody in you know how much land there is in this country yeah you absolutely know, create, create jobs you know somehow like the dakotas montana you mean to tell mm -hmm. me there's no room for people there and and to make our nation greater i think so okay all right well no that's uh, fair enough i'm not uh, you know when i say that healthcare isn't a right i'm not mm -hmm. saying that there's no business like zero business for the government in healthcare. That's not the point I'm trying to make. You know, mm -hmm. when you, as far as I'm concerned, like get, going back to that issue, you know, healthcare is either a right or it isn't, you know? And so my point of view is no, it's not a right because, you know, healthcare impose, you know, uh, medical treatments cost. I mean, they just, they just do, you know, the, the materials, that you need to make medicines, you know, the raw materials, you know, a doctor spending his time to learn to be a doctor. You know, you can't you can't just say I have a right to some of that. I have a right to this doctor's treatment. I have a so but that doesn't mean that the government has no place in it, because I also believe like I'm a libertarian. I think the, the role of the government needs to be as small as it can possibly be. But that doesn't sure. mean that doesn't mean zero. And I actually I'm a little bit less stringent in my kind of libertarianism that I used to be in that I realized that part of the part of the um, part of the role of the government is is to act as a stabilizing force, because I believe that a, you know, I don't believe in anarchy. You know, I don't believe that you can just say no rules, no government, no laws. You know, uh, you can't have a large complex and, and you know, 
technological right. society with no laws. I just don't think that's possible. So you want what you want to do is you want to make sure that you know life is as uh, uh, the less pol- the less politicized as it can be. But there's still gonna you're still gonna have some politics. So I actually I'm actually okay to some degree with the government having a role in in medical care. But we have to realize that you know the government is limited in what it can do. And it's not, you know, the government isn't just a, a a genie in a lamp, you know, that can just grant all your wishes. You know, it's like government is there's limitations in what government can do. You can only spend a dollar once. And if you tax a dollar away from somebody to provide, you know, services or whatever, you can only do that. You can only spend it once. Then that dollar, another dollar has to be recreated. And if you, I, I agree, I agree with that. So right. what I would do, what, what my thinking is. Let's give less to the Pentagon and bring it into healthcare and help the poor that need critical help. Uh, right? Yeah, dude. I'm listen, say, I, I'd rather see my tax dollars at work helping people than funding the military complex. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we've already got enough ammunition. What they say to to the, the six biggest other countries in the world. Why do we need six times? Why not just one time? Right. Yeah, that's that's a fair that's a fair criticism. Um, you know, I, the one thing I always try to keep in mind, like I I delivered <laughs> I delivered pizza for several years. Um, sure. You know, that's why I'm not wealthy. Uh, when you know, when Fozzie would not be touring, I, I had a job delivering pizza because it's flexible. The money was OK, you know, and sure. uh, where I, am, I I delivered it for uh, Marietta Pizza, which is right on the square. Since, you know, Marietta, oh, you know where that is. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, Kennestone Hospital is right up the road. And I did, deli- I did a lot. Of- yeah. My son was born in Kennestone Hospital. My son was born there too. Oh, um, sure. Yeah. So I, you know, I delivered to, you know, I delivered to like the neonatal uh, ICU unit. I delivered to, you know, a lot of people in the hospital and I saw, you know, and I've, I've been in hospitals plenty, you know, probably as you have, and you see people, you see people, you see suffering in a hospital, even a hospital in the United States that's as well maintained, you know, it's not a, you know, in a third world or whatever, you know, but you still see human suffering. And it's yeah. like, I, you know, I would see this and I would see people suffering and think, man, you know, I think it's a human impulse to say, can't we do something about this? You know, can't we, can't we make it so that these people don't have to suffer? And the problem with that is, is like, I'm also not a utopianist. I don't believe that all suffering can be alleviated. I mean, that's part of suffering is part of the human condition, unfortunately, but you can't just, you can't simply wish it away and you can't just, you know, you can't just depend on the government to, to pour money on suffering and expect it to go away. No matter what there's, I mean, when you look at, when you look at our society, a modern society, if you could go back in time and take somebody from, 200 300 a thousand years ago and bring them forward in time to our place now and show them around they'd be they'd be flabbergasted at how well we live you know Mm -hmm. and but there would still be suffering you know suffering is just a part of it's a part of life and i'd like to try to alleviate it as much as i can but you also have to i think you have to realize that anything you do can have unintended consequences you know, when you and when you're dealing with complexity, you're all you're always dealing with the the chance that you could make things worse. You know, just because you make just because you make the effort to make something better doesn't mean that you can't make it worse. Just because your intentions are good, and politics is a corrosive force. And it's you know, the old adage, uh, "Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely." Mm-hmm. And the problem is, is when you give people power to spend money on your behalf, you're giving them power as well. You know, even if, even if your intentions are good, even if it's for, you know, trying to alleviate suffering, if you give somebody the power to spend great, great, great amounts of money and make laws that people must follow or else they go to jail, you know, you're giving people power and power is always corrosive and power is always dangerous. So I've got no problem with the idea of the government having a hand in, in the, uh, in the, in medical care, but we have to recognize its limitations and you can't just give it to them and say, listen, you solve the problem. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the and- only thing I think that, you know, with Obamacare, 
Mm -hmm. uh, the best thing that happened to it because it actually helps my son's mother mm -hmm. is she has MS and she mm -hmm. couldn't get insurance because she had a pre-existing condition. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the positives that happened with it. You know what? Okay. And here she's willing to pay a premium, but you still won't give her the insurance to help her suffering. Why mm -hmm. not? Because it's going right. to cost you a little bit more money for, for you giving her health care and you're going to make less profit. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. to me, it's just like the oil, you know, oil's back down to where it was before this insane increase mm -hmm. and gas still here, $6 a gallon. Why? Mm -hmm. The barrel, the price of oil just went down to where it was pre this is greed, you know, yeah. and that's fine. You know, it's, it's, it's an open market, man. If I want to charge 10 times what I'm, but I, I don't have a monopoly. They do. You have to have gasoline for your car mm -hmm. unless you drive a Tesla, which mm -hmm. by the way, I put one on order because I'm done with gas and oil and everything else. So now I'm going to drive around a battery and they're not going to get any of my money. And my new home is solar powered. So it's going to cost me zero. And I'll be getting a rebate because I'll be generating more electricity than I'm actually going to use. And I'll pay you money back for that electricity to service it somewhere else. So, mm -hmm. You know, and that's the thing about knowing things like these are things I didn't know about, you know, so every day I'm learning something, mm -hmm. you know, I know that everybody's fortunate enough to be able to do those things. But if, if you even late in life, like myself, if I can do it, just about anybody else can, you yeah. know, but the suffering in the world, this is where I guess we disagree. It's like, you know, yeah, people are going to suffer. They're going to die. Everybody's going to die. You know? Yeah. Like, I mean, that's yeah. the one, that's the first thing you have to come to terms with as a human being yeah. is death. Is my, my father said it on his deathbed, you know, uh, he died of cancer. And the last time I was in Atlanta was to see him pass away in a hospice. And he told me, he goes, don't feel bad. He goes, the doctors told me 10 out of 10 people are going to die. <laughs> now is my turn. Yeah. I always had a sense of humor, even on the deathbed. But yeah. I was just like, man, you know, and I, and, he had the, the best health care, you know, he could have because he could afford it. But a lot, you know, and it prolonged his life a few years, you know, and who doesn't want to be with a loved one a few more years, you know. But yeah. uh, but when I see like GoFundMe campaigns for, for people, you know, matter of fact, I got one from this guy, his daughter has brain cancer, you know. Mm -hmm. Could you please share this with all your followers because, you know, this uh, we don't have insurance and the treatments, you know, or she's going to die, you know. Mm -hmm to see that man like not me so no, I, yeah i mean it overwhelms me when i think about it like i did a i did a gofundme campaign myself it's still going mm -hmm. on but i mean it was just for you know because i'm trying to start an art career and you know at first i was hesitant to even do it because of you know all the you know you tragedy should, you let me tell you because everyone needs a jump start every now and then like yeah i didn't get my movies made because i funded them I had right. to go out and ask for money, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what you got to do sometimes. Yeah. And uh, lucky for me, both my movies were funded fully. And mm -hmm. then I was able to sell them and pay these people back and make a little bit of coin for myself. But, you know, you shouldn't be afraid to ask. Mm. And I, I did. And it, it, it helped me. I mean, I, I definitely helped it helped keep the bills paid and has helped me pursuing, you know, doing pursuing this and pursuing art and, and all kinds of sure. things. And I, you know, I, I looked around and I saw that there were other people doing the same thing. It's not all people, you know, in tragic circumstances, but I know what you're saying. I, you know, I've looked around on GoFundMe and, you know, we're so connected now on the internet that we, you know, yep. if you, if you allow it to, you know, tragedy can overwhelm you. You know, I know it does me at times. I think to myself, yeah. you know, my wife and I, um, you know, my wife and I always talk about if we ever won the lottery, um, that we would become professional philanthropists, you know, and yeah. that if like if I all of a sudden had like truckloads of money, you know, I would I would love nothing better than to like try to use, you know, I wouldn't live a lot higher than I do now. You know, it's like I I, I actually enjoy my life in terms of, uh, you know, where I live and like I don't need tons of fancy things. I don't need expensive things. You know, I just want financial security. And I'd love the I'd love to be a philanthropist. I'd love to go, you know, I watched a story on the news today when I was at the gym um, of this woman uh, on the news whose son, I didn't see how old he was, but he was probably nine, 10, couldn't be any more than that, who was shot 
you know, and is in the hospital struggling to survive. And, you know, she's, you know, trying to, you know, get the bills paid and everything. And my first thought was like, I would love nothing better than to be in a position financially to just seek out that person and say, I got this. You're, you know, don't worry about it. I got it. It would be, it would be fantastic. But But on a large, on a large scale, how do you do that? There's millions of people suffering. And I got to tell you, so some well, of it's like I own- said, you can't do it completely. You no, know, and, you- and a lot of it's our own fault, man. I think, I think we're the, you know, the country with the most um, diagnosis for type two diabetes. Mm-hmm. For the most part, that's a self-induced uh, condition mm-hmm. because I have yeah. it. Why do I have it? Mm-hmm. Just like you said, you don't know if you believe in science or not. It's all, you know, you question it. But according to my doctor, it's my own fault because they eat shit, mm-hmm. right? Sugary food, they eat fat shit. Yep. I didn't have diabetes before. I didn't know I had it until I was on tour with Stain. I couldn't get out of my bunk until mm-hmm. it was almost showtime. I was just lethargic and just, and I, you know, I went for my yearly thing, man. They made me pee in a cup and the doctor came and said, man, you got sugar in your urine. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to, let's do a blood test. Yeah. You sure enough. Work- yeah, I worry right. about that for myself, you know. I, yeah, I, I worry it's about that my own fault. So, again, should the government or everybody else pay for my fuck ups? Yeah, that's the question. That is a question. That's a perfectly reasonable question. It's like, you know, how, where does your res- that That's the big thing for me is like, where does your responsibility for yourself end and somebody else's, you know, the government's begin, you know, because, um, should you know because the the, it's a fair question to say well i have now i have these large medical bills you know but they're they're self-induced you know and that's a hard thing to make that's a hard thing to do is to make that uh that delineation like okay well this person deserves it because it's not their fault this person it is their fault and I, i like i said i i i wouldn't mind the government being more involved in healthcare, but it's like they are they have their hands in so much and mm-hmm. not and, and I'm not talking about militarily. That's that one's an obvious one, you know, but there's so many there's so many things that the government funds and pays for, you know, that to me, when somebody says, yeah, well, we should have Medicare for everybody. It's like, OK, fair enough. You know, I, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. But what do we what do we sacrifice for that in that like the government funds this out of the other thing do we sacrifice those things you know like yeah um, like it drives me crazy if i see like oh here's three million dollars to research geckos mating exactly that whole thing that kind of shit that's just waste to me yeah there's um geckos alone they'll be fine mating trust there's (laughs) there's a really there's a really great book that one of my favorite authors who just passed away pj o'rourke have you ever heard of pj o'rourke Love that guy. Yeah, he's fantastic. I actually, I enjoyed him, man. I used to watch him, believe it or not, on Bill Maher. He used mm-hmm. to be a regular guest. And the guy's not only funny as shit, but as sharp as a whip. Yeah. Have you ever read his books? I have not. I would. There's two books I would recommend of his if you want to pick them up. The first one's called Parliament of Whores. Um, mm-hmm. And it's probably his magnum opus uh, book. And there's another one called All the Trouble in the World. And, um, but one of the things he talks about in Parliament of Whores is he talks about, I think it's the federal register where like everything the government spends money on is like in the federal register. And it's, it's a list of accounts. And this is in, this is 30 years ago and the government has only grown since then. Um, there's like 190,000 accounts, right? And the federal government spends money on things like the federal, federal wool and mohair, act which ensures that people who grow wool and mohair have the federal funding they need you know in order to you know to do that and it's like which can anybody who doesn't grow wool you know argue (laughs) that that's the complete waste of of at least federal money and and then a lot of people will say, oh, well, that's just this, you know, that's just a, a few million dollars. You know, it's like, why are you why are you making a big deal over just a few million dollars? It's like, OK, well, that's a few million dollars that you can't spend on health care. Right. So why don't we go through the federal register and go through all those things and just start just like because I remember when uh, 
when uh, Obama was president and he said, uh, you know, we're going to go after the federal budget, but we're not going to go after it with a machete. We're going to go after it with a scalpel. My thinking is it's like an overgrown jungle. You don't cut your way through an overgrown jungle with a scalpel. You cut through it with a machete. Sure. What, what, what do you have against going at it with a machete? Let's do that. Let's take a machete to the federal budget. Let's start. Um, and, you know, PJ, uh, it, it, there, there's a great um, chapter in Parliament of Horrors where he balances the federal budget. And he's like, he does it in a federal in a few pages. He's like, that was easy. And actually, it is if you have the will to do it, if you have the political will to do it. The problem is all those people have our special interests. It's like they don't want their they don't say, want their yeah. funding cut off, you know, how many but lobbyists, he, like, lobbyists yeah. should be taken out. In my yeah, opinion, I, I got no, I got no problem with that. No lobbyists. Uh, insider trading is another big thing. You mean to tell me these members of Congress don't know what the fuck is going on? Of course yeah. they do. Yeah. That's why you see even like a Nancy Pelosi like stocking up on whatever she's getting into and and then selling it off and you know these stock buybacks, mm -hmm. you know, is, is another big problem. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I will say this, man. As as much as I loathe Trump. Uh, when he was president, the stock market for me mm -hmm. was doing twice as good as it is now. Now, I don't know if that's the president's thing. <laughs> right. I mean, I don't, no, I don't like that whole thing of like, you yeah. know, first of all, I think we, I think we, uh, focus way too much on the actual presidency. Correct. You know? yeah. Um, but is it a coincidence that he was president and it was like two days after Biden took office is when you know, just went flat. I didn't, I didn't lose money. Just kind of just went flat yeah. instead of making gains of my God, man, sometimes 20% on some stocks, it just went flat and it's kind of remained that way. And now that this war has happened, mm -hmm. you know, it's up, but you know, uh, I, before I forget about it, I do want to say um, on that whole PJ O'Rourke thing, talking about balancing the budget, he mm -hmm. said, I believe in the, uh, the O'Rourke, uh, circumcision rule. You can take 10% off the top of anything. <laughs> That's true. So, yeah. So he's like, you know, so let's just start off with the federal budget, like the entire thing, military, everything cut 10% out of it right away. I, I, it sounds kind of, it sounds kind of silly to say things like that, but I'm kind of an advocate of those kind of just like big, obvious things, you know, take 10% mm -hmm. off the top of the federal budget. Just, just have the discipline and just do it. Um, I'm a big, I talked in my last podcast, um, about, uh, about term limits. I'm a big fan of congressional term limits. I, and I, and I think yeah. that's a, I think that is a bipartisan issue. I think there's any number of people who are staunch Democrats, any number of people who are staunch Republicans who would be perfectly fine with, with limiting how long you can serve in, in the, uh, in the Congress, in the federal yeah, Congress, but unless you're a congressman or a congresswoman, right? Exactly. I, I mean, that business that that that's not going to happen for not in our lifetime. I don't think. Oh, and that's and that's one of the things that I that all the rest of the stuff to me is just kind of useless haggling when we're talking about whether we should have Medicare for all or whether we should have this, that, or the other thing. It's like until we're going to limit Congress's power. It's, right. it's all just, we're just pissing in the wind, you know? Um, I also, I also advocate for setting a, a, a limit on how much of the GDP the government is allowed to spend. It's like, we're supposed to be a government of the people. The people should stand up and say, you're only allowed to spend this much of what we produce. Cause that's what they're doing when they spend money, they're spending what the, the people produce. You can only spend this much of it, you know? And it's like, Fight right. over it, you know. You guys you know, fight I'm, over how much you spent. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't mind fighting, but here's the thing, and you probably know this too. In France, mm -hmm. if the people don't like something, mm -hmm. they will go on the streets and demand it. Right. And usually they win. Right. Here, you know, is it, are Americans lazy? Are we too big of a country to like protest in unity somehow? I, I don't know. I. You know, it's a it's a radical idea, but I wonder if we are too big a country. Yeah. I wonder if you can, you know. I say too big. I mean, 
and girth. Like America's humongous. Well, that's you know, what we have, I, yeah, that's what I mean too. It's like, yeah. how do you, you know, cause I just don't know that like such a large country can be managed. You know, I mean, I certainly right. felt that up until recently, but we've become so polarized and so divided. Well, that's and the I know, thing. And you're right because I hate to cut you off, but like, no, no, Florida, Texas, Mississippi, West Virginia. Do you think they're ever going to come together with California, New York, Chicago, Seattle? Probably Maybe not. not. Yeah. So it's like we're we're fighting against our our own our own uh, best interest, mm. you know. And some of the shit I read come out of Texas, and, th and this is the the liberal side of me when I read shit from like. Greg Abbott in Texas, like, you know, mm -hmm. on his abortion stance or stuff being allowed in schools. It's like, well, you guys are so like pro do your own thing, you know, don't, don't interfere, mm -hmm. but they're interfering in the, in the most radical way you can interfere. Why? In what way? Be more specific. Like abortion rights, mm -hmm. you know, now there's people and I, I don't think abortion should be, in my opinion, I would never use abortion as a, a form of birth control. Mm -hmm. But in the in the heat of passion, I'm guilty of it myself, man. You're with some chick and you're getting all hot and heavy and you're not thinking about a condom as a teenager. You're thinking about hitting a grand slam. And sometimes you do in an accident. Well, and it is an accident. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, perfectly trying to get somebody pregnant. I'm not saying I've done this, but I'm just in general. Well, thankfully I haven't either. I know what you mean. Yeah. I know what you mean. I mean, we've all, yes. we've like, all been young. Yeah. yeah. So here you are in Texas, you're young, you get a girl knocked up. She may not have the means to, to go across the border to get an abortion. So you're going to force her to have this child. And now it's going to be a, I hate to say this, a drag on society because who's going to pay for it? Our tax dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, she could have simply went, spent 400 bucks or got a plan B pill uh, and taking care of it, you know, yeah. and I know it's your responsibility, but again, when you're a teenager and your hormones are running or whatever, and you know, you, you've got a stiff one and the chick's down mm -hmm. it happens, you're both down, you know, yeah. it is your responsibility in the long run, but should that, should that be such a heavy burden for, for a teen that doesn't have anything or for now society to now raise this child? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's a, that's a good question. And I, I talked about, uh, on my last podcast, I talked about this. And so I think it's a, it's a, it's a complex issue. I go back and forth on it. You know, I have gone back and forth on it all my life. Um, and you have to, the first thing for me is you have to think about, you have to think about the moral question, which is, despite all the circumstances like you're talking about, you know, are we talking about a human creature? You know, is the, is the embryo, the blastocyst, the embryo, is it a human being? Is it a, is it a human creature? So From we're talking what, about this, this human creature die because they can't provide healthcare for themselves 20 years later, 10 years later when they're a child. So well, see, that's the thing. I, I don't, I, I, I don't look at it as, well, first of all, like when you when you're talking about, say, a 16 year old girl who's pregnant and you're talking about all the and let's say, you know, there, there's the kind there there was always kind of the dividing line between viability, you know, invite inviability and viability. And that was mm -hmm. always kind of the line of demarcation as to when you could have an abortion, you know, right. like up to a certain point, you could legally have an abortion and 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 past that point, you couldn't, which for me in, 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 in an unsolvable problem is a, is a decent compromise, right? I, I, I don't like the idea of abortion. I think I, I, don't I, I can't justify it more morally, no matter what, but you have to deal with it because it's a reality. I think a decent compromise is the whole idea of like up to a certain point of viability. You know, there's a line, you know, you, once you get past that line, you don't cross it. Um, and I think that's a decent compromise. It doesn't solve the problem, but it, you know, you have to find some compromise, you know? Um, so can we find a compromise for healthcare. If we can find a compromise for that, why can't we do it for healthcare to save yeah, somebody well, that has zero means to take care of themselves for whatever I, reason? 
yeah, I mean, I'm I'm okay with that. I'm fine with finding a compromise in healthcare. I'm fine. I, I, my whole life is about finding compromises. I, you know, right. um, but what we'll get back to the abortion thing. But one of the problems with finding, go, you know, compromises with government, like you know, why can't we do this out of the other with government, is the whole question of well, if we do that, certainly we can do this. You know, there's right. always the there's always the question. People always bring up, well, we're a rich country. Why can't we? If we can put a man on the moon, why can't we do this out of the other thing? And eventually, you just run into the brick wall of government is limited in what it can do. You have to set the limits somewhere. You know, so. Right. Um, so as far as the whole abortion thing is concerned, I would say on both sides of the issue, you know, um, that both sides on some level, I hate to sound, I hate to use, you know, this kind of language, but both sides need to be willing to comp chill out and compromise. Um, because like, I don't, I, I don't like abortion. I don't really agree with it. Um, if I knew, like, say, if I knew somebody who's in that position, I would try to convince them, like, listen, you know, you're, you'll probably regret this if you do it. Um, you know, you should, you should try to, you know, maybe give it away for adoption. I know I, I, you know, I'm not in your position. So, you know, it's not like I'm telling you what you should or shouldn't do, but, you know, I, I don't think it's right. Um, but I'm sorry. I kind of lost my train of thought a little bit. I don't no. think it's, I don't think it's right, but I think that both sides should be willing to compromise somewhat, you know, the, the side of the left, the, um, the people who want people to be able to have abortions up to a certain point, at least should be at least able to acknowledge the, I think insanity of something like a partial birth, partial birth abortion, especially for something like, especially for something like birth control. Now, I mean, obviously, from a medical standpoint, there's going to be circumstances where the health of the mother is at issue, right? So that's tragic that you would have to abort a child to save the health, you know, to save the life of the mother. But if you're in that position, you're in that position and you have to choose. To me, that I mean, choice there's, there's, I think in Texas, too, it's the thing where even if you're, if it's in incest, they're going to make you carry that baby or a rape. You're mm -hmm. carrying that baby to term. Yeah, that's just, to me unfathomable. I couldn't imagine, you know, my sister carrying a rape baby. Yeah, you know, that was well, so tragic to her. And why should she be forced to do that? That's not something she wanted or asked mm -hmm. for. And, and, and I'd be, it, yeah, you know, I'd be willing to. I'm, I'm personally willing to make that compromise. I don't like it, but I'm, right. I'm willing to do it for the sake of. But I would like if I was making a deal with somebody and say, OK, I'm willing to say if you suffered rape or incest, you're able to abort the baby. I don't think it's morally correct, but you should be able to do it. On the other hand, what if it wasn't rape or incest? And it's, you know, and it's past the point of, you know, viability. Right. Should you is is it an absolute right? Because if it's an absolute right then you should be able to abort it even up to the, even up to the moment of birth. If it's an absolute right. And I, you know, so if you're going to, if you're going to say, well, listen, on your side, you say it's okay to abort a baby uh, that's, that's exists because of rape or incest. Okay. But you have to say you can't use it as birth control. So if we're going to compromise, let's compromise, you know? And I don't think it should be used as a form of birth control, but you know, but are you willing to support making it illegal as a form of birth control? That's the question. That's the hard one. That is a hard one because, like I said, a 16-year-old or a 14-year-old that's experimenting with sex fucks yeah. up and gets pregnant. Should they? Yeah. I don't want to. I hate to word you suffer because I love my son more than you can even imagine. Like right. more than my own life, and I, 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 there's no way that I could ever get rid of him. But that's not me, mm -hmm. you know. Right, and. To a certain degree, I, I'm I'm with the libertarian of like it's your body, you do what you want with it. You shouldn't yeah. tell me what it doesn't affect me in any way, shape, or form. What you do with your own body, tattoo. Well, I don't think it's your. I don't think it's your own body. You so you so what do you it's think? A, it's an indep It's not independent, but it's a separate entity because from from the point of view of DNA, it's not your DNA. You know, DNA is the is the is the indicator of a of a human being. You know, it's it's the building block of a human being. 
And it's like, you know, a woman who's pregnant, you take a, a DNA sample from any part of her body and it's her DNA. Undoubtedly, you sure. take DNA from the from the embryo. It's different DNA. You know, it's a it's a it's a different entity than you. So it's not simply your body. I don't I don't think that's a I don't think that's a proper argument. And I think science I think scientifically we've moved far enough uh, to to understand that from a scientific point of view. I don't think there's any actual scientist who would say from a scientific point of view that it is the woman's body and therefore, you know, hers to do anything she wants with, you know. So I think we have to argue there's any kind of there's any number of arguments we can have, but we have to argue from that framework in that when to me, when you say and I don't think there's any proper argument against it, you can't say it's your body. You do with it as you wish, because like. You know, your appendix, sure. Your finger, sure. You know, like cut off your own arm if you want to. It's your body. Do with it as you want, right? right? But from a scientific perspective, I don't think you can argue from that point of view that it's like, well, a pregnant woman is her body. She can do what she wants because I. it's like, she does she temporarily have four feet? You know, does she temporarily have four arms? you know, and four eyes and two noses, you know, it's like the, the being inside her has those things. I mean, I understand that, you know, in the first couple of weeks, it's somewhat unformed, but, but you don't know you're pregnant until you're about six weeks. And that's when they right. want to, Oh, now, you know, you're pregnant. You're fucked. Yeah. Well, I mean, Hey, it's listen, it's a tough one. I, maybe, I agree. maybe, maybe, maybe 12 weeks by then yeah. you surely know you're pregnant. Yeah. Well, okay. like I, I tell you something that helped me that kind of helped me form my opinion. And I've thought about this for a long time. Um, uh, do you are you uh, are you familiar with the uh, and if anybody's watched my last podcast, if I'm repeating myself, I'm sorry. But have you seen the movie um, Unplanned? I believe it was called. It's like I an anti not. it's an anti-abortion movie, surprisingly enough. Um, but I listened to an interview of a guy who is the uh, the technical consultant who was a doctor who's performed thousands of abortions according to him. And, um, and he like, he was a, an abortion advocate all the way for years and years and years. He performed abortions. He was, you know, he was solidly on the pro abortion side for a mm -hmm. long time until he lost his daughter in a car accident. And um, he said for a long time, after, even after he lost his daughter, he was he hadn't changed. And then the change came about um, suddenly. And if I'm not if I'm if I'm not misremembering his story, he said that he was performing an abortion on a teenage girl who this was her fifth abortion. Oh, and wow. the, re the reason she was getting an abortion was because her prom was coming up and she didn't want to be pregnant for her prom. So she was getting an abortion. And it's like. Okay, now what do you think about this? The Plan B pill. At, to the degree I know anything about it, I don't have a problem with it. Yeah, because so from what I understand, you take it the day, the day you know, after, and three it, days, I think it's a grace period that it'll work. Right. From my understanding, yeah, right. it prevents the it prevents something from attaching to the uterine wall. It prevents the uh, Correct. you know it prevents the process. It doesn't like interrupt the process so from you know to the degree like i said to the degree i understand it i'm okay with it you know um i'm not one of those people i want to say that the the government will help subsidize some of that stuff too for for poor for poor people who would be in need for something like this too yeah you know and some yeah. girls can't take birth control pills because it just doesn't agree with their body it, it messes them up mm -hmm. in many ways and uh but, I mean, do we need any more people that are unwanted in this country? Well, okay. You know, one thing I was going to say was the problem with that argument is that it still applies once the baby's born. Right. right? Yeah. So you would never, at least I don't think, you would never advocate for killing an actual baby that's exited the, no. the birth canal. Matter right. of fact, I, I I welcome immigrants into this country. I'm one. I'm an immigrant. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, <laughs> what I'm saying is, is like the the um I, maybe I misunderstood what you were trying to say, but like the whole mm -hmm. unwanted baby 
argument, like the the child who grows up unwanted, the child yeah. who is going to uh, grow up in difficult financial circumstances because they were quote unquote. Well, this is what I hear a lot of conservatives saying. They're like, "Well, why, why would you bring somebody in this world you're not going to be able to take care of? Who wants to see a child like, you know, my my mm -hmm. father." we grew very close, you know, the last 20 years or so. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, he, he left me and my mother here in those, like he dropped us off at the Boston homes, government housing with nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I saw how difficult my, it was for my mother to raise me, you know, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I don't like, and I'm sure you don't like the word luck either. Cause I'm sure a lot of, Oh, you're lucky. No, there's no luck, man. It's fucking hard work and determination and desperation and clawing your way through shit. Mm -hmm. Arrive here decades later. Uh, this mm -hmm. did not happen to me overnight, and it was due to my hard work. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I hear a lot of conservatives just say, why would, Why do I want to see somebody suffer like this, you know, and, and grow up poor and sponge off of me now? Now I'm going to mm -hmm. be paying for your health care, your schooling that I don't want to pay for anyway, because, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm having a little trouble understanding. Well, the, they, they just think of these, these the, I'll, I'll put it, the white trash government handout people as the dregs of society. And by these poor people continuing to having babies, they're just creating more of that. Mm. That's what I hear the conservatives say. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm listening to different conservatives, <laughs> you know, cause I, I, I mean, I, uh, cause I don't, I, I can't think of any conservative who advocates for the, I, are you saying that conservatives who advocate for the idea of abortion? Because no, of that? No, 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 they advocate for, they advocate yeah, for sexual that, responsibility. That they do. But again, they, they must forget them being hot teenagers back in the day. You know, right. Uh, and it was a different era back then, you know, in the leave it to beaver days or whatever, but, mm -hmm. but it's, it's changed, you know, the, the, the pendulum has swung the other way, you know, there's, there's on social media, man, you know, I, I remember being on the road, girls just DMing you or whatever on Facebook or whatever they could like, Oh, you think I can get a backstage? Da, 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 and, you know, mm -hmm. right. Right. So it's like, you know, yeah, but to me, happen. and and you're in, a, in El Paso, Texas, mm -hmm. just say I knocked up a chick in El Paso. That's this poor Hispanic person. She doesn't have any means to take care of the kid. You know, she doesn't know how to get a hold of me. Who's going to raise that kid? That's a good question. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a completely legitimate. And, she has, and she's before six weeks pregnant. And she finds out she's pregnant at week five and a half. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have a mode of transportation. How is she going to get to Arizona or California mm -hmm. to get an abortion? Because she can't get one in Texas after six weeks. It's just not going right. to happen. You know? Right. And now who's, who's paying for that child for its food stamps, you know, medical and the taxpayer. Yeah. And that's what drives the conservatives I've spoken to insane. They can't mm -hmm. take it, you know, they, mm -hmm. they hate it, but at the same time they hate abortion too. So it's kind of like, there's, there's no compromise with them. Yeah. And I've, I've had that discussion before. Um, and I'm not necessarily against the idea of telling conservatives who are staunch anti-abortionists because I'm not necessarily a staunch anti-abortionist. You know, I'm mm -hmm. not one of those people who advocates for, you know, the complete and utter abolition of abortion in all circumstances, because I just don't think that's a realistic position to have. Right. Um, so uh, I would say, you know, and I've had people make that kind of the forgotten child argument, like who takes care of the forgotten child, you know, and should the government have some responsibility? OK, well, I mean, if like if you're going to advocate for the complete abolition of abortion across the board, Maybe you should advocate for then, you know, government programs to to help the, the child, you know. But, you know, government programs don't exactly, you know, government programs keep you from, you know, uh, safe, you know, a safety net keeps you from hitting the ground. 
You sure. Know? <laughs> it doesn't mean that your life is particularly wonderful just because you have a safety net that keeps you from just utterly smacking the pavement, you know? Right. Um, so, you know, you're going to, a child is going to grow up in, in, uh, com, you know, difficult circumstances in that situation, no matter what. Um, so, you know, I don't pretend to have an answer, you know, I, I don't pretend to have some kind of, uh, you know, I, I'm not King Solomon. I don't, I don't, <laughs> you know, I don't have all the answers, but when you ask, you know, when you ask me what you think is, is, a, is moral, you know, when you ask me from just a philo philosophical perspective, what is it that you think is right and, and not right? What is moral and immoral? You know, like, like I said, going back to the whole, you know, when we're having this discussion, there's certain things that I want to be able to kind of just take off the table, you know, and the whole, like, uh, the whole notion, the whole notion that it's a woman's right to choose what she wants with her body. Okay. Well, I think we have to take that card out of our deck and toss it aside because it's, it doesn't apply. Now, what do you do? Okay. Now, what do you do? You figure it out from there and it's not an easy thing to figure out. So, um, like I said, I don't have all the answers, but if you ask me, is it, is it a, is it a baby inside the woman? Yes. Is it wrong to kill it? Is it morally wrong to, to kill it? Yes. You know, and is even it morally if, wrong not to take care of it once it's outside the womb? Well, it's certainly wrong for the, for the person who willingly, I think it's willing, uh, it's morally wrong for the person who willingly had sex, even if she was a young girl, a teenager, sowing her wild oats, like we all have done, like you said, we've all been there. Yeah. You know, but if I had gotten a, if I had gotten a girl pregnant when I was sowing my wild oats, I didn't sow that many. But if I did, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, right. like if I had sitting here now, if you ask me, would it have been your responsibility and it would it have been immoral for you to to just kill it? I'd say, yeah, I can't get away from that. And it's understand. I mean, listen, I've been in that. I guess I've been in that position, like you said, where you're young, you're having a good time. Your hormones mm -hmm. are kicking. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But if you ask me now, if that had happened, if some girl had come up pregnant, would it have been wrong for you to advocate that she had an abortion? If I'm at, if you're asking me right now, it's that, yeah, it had been wrong for me to do that. I might have. It would have been a giant, if you're smart, because I got caught shoplifting once. Guess what? I never did it again. Right. So there's something to be learned. It's a, it's a heavy, a heavy cost when you're talking about a, a, a human being. But at the same time, it's like that that's, you know, not only are you so young, you, you've unless you're super fortunate and and do and do a lot of the right things, you've got a leg down in, in life now, you know, because your your time spent raising this child, you know, yeah. and uh, and taking care of it, which again it's your responsibility. You know, you did it, you should do it. But at the same time, I, I don't know, it's tough, man, because I have a child. Yeah, it is, dude. It's, it's hard when you have a kid, but at the same time, man, it's like I, I see a lot of the damage it would do. This is not an easy thing. That's why well, people have been I'll debating this. And you talking about it now because I'm thinking about it. I'm like, I'm looking at my kid who I love more than my life. You know, yep. I know. But, yeah, and that's yeah. It's a it's a tough thing. I can tell you, I can tell you what's easy for me in this situation is the attitudes at the extremes. You know, from, mm -hmm. you know, like, even though I, I, I philosophically have more in agreement with the people who are, you know, anti-abortion, complete anti-abortion activists, I don't think it's a, I, I, from a practical standpoint, I don't think it's, I don't think it gets the outcome that you want. You know, it's like, if your outcome is no abortions, well, just, just making it, just banning it and saying, that's it. It's just illegal. No, no further discussion to be had. You know, you might end up with more abortion, you know, in the long run. So even though I maybe, you know, from a moral standpoint, I'm more along those lines. I don't I, I still think it's an extreme position. I don't advocate for extreme positions. But the people that kind of shout your abortion crowd, you know, what I'm talking about, yeah. you know, hey, man, when, like, I lived, when I lived in Marin County, which was one of the most liberal places ever, the anti-abortion people. We're at a Planned Parenthood every single morning when I drove by with just these horrific pictures 
you know, of the most extreme stuff you'll see. You know, mm -hmm. I'm sure every abortion is not like that, but like babies laying on the table, cut up or whatever. But uh, and this was a, a Planned Parenthood I helped fund. You know, I gave mm -hmm. them money every month. And not just because not not for just abortions, but they do a lot of great things, you know, uh, mm -hmm. cancer uh, prevention and all this other stuff that uh, poor people don't have access to, mm -hmm. you know, but should I be paying for that? You know, why, why am I giving them 200 bucks a month for I, I'd rather take, like you said, 10 percent out of the military budget. Let's fund Planned Parenthood with that. So the poor people can get checked and get screenings and everything else. Cause that's a majority of what they do. A very small percentage is abortion. Very mm -hmm. small. Most of it's, you know, I've heard arguments both ways on that. Yeah. So I don't know. I've never, I've never done a study on planned parent. I've never looked at planned parenthood's books. I used to get my, you know what, when I was younger, I used to get mm -hmm. my condoms from there cause they were free. <laughs> I, I was responsible and Good I didn't have to, well, yeah. And I didn't have to go to a drug store and be embarrassed. Right. As, as a young guy going to the counter, like with my ribbed Trojans or whatever, they just give you a handful. Here you go. Be, be safe. You know, right. Good thing, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I, um, go ahead. Yeah. That, that's just my thought on Planned Parenthood. A lot of people think they're just evil abortion people, but you know, you look at their, their charts and it's, it's a teeny fraction of what they do. Most of the stuff they do is, is mammograms, breast examinations, gynecologists, you know, mm -hmm. and it's for, for the extreme poor, you know, that, yeah. that can't afford to go to the doctor, don't have health insurance and it's preventative maintenance. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I've heard, I've heard different perspectives on that. Sure. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to try to, you know, advocate for or against an, an, an actual organization like Planned Parenthood, because I don't know. I've certainly heard things that have curled my toes, you know, that made me just go, God, you got to be kidding. But, you know, maybe maybe I was hearing propaganda. I don't know. Um, That's another thing about, you know, this new age. You know, when we came up, like you said, there was no YouTube, no Facebook, no Twitter, no Snapchat. Mm -hmm. Like you weren't getting fed propaganda that we yeah. are now. You know, it's yeah. just like you can say anything you want and pay no price. And I think it's a great thing when they, when they, and you'll, you'll probably disagree with me, but with so probably. many, so many zombies out here that, that believe every word that comes out of everybody's mouth, it does damage mm -hmm. and permanent damage. You know, people there, there's lives at risk here. Mm -hmm. And when Trump got banned from Twitter or even, even, I can't think of many liberals that have, but if they, if they said something that was not true, that would put people in harm's way and, and do mass damage. Good. They should be blocked. And let's not forget it's a private company. They can do whatever they want. Mm. Yeah. I don't necessarily agree. You were okay. expecting that. Yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, and I'm time. talking about in extreme situations like, okay, what he just said could get people killed. Mm -hmm. You know, this is radical and can hurt somebody, mm -hmm. you know? Well, and, and, and social media is just so big now. Like every teenager I look at, it's just, that's all they do. They stare at the phone and read this stuff. And what if it influences them to go stab somebody or mm -hmm. kill someone, you know? Yes, it's their responsibility. But, you know, when they're hearing this figure, that's the leader of the free world, telling them to, to do things the, that's wrong. You know? Well, can, can you speak to something specific that he told people to do? And well, I'm, I'm saying be specific, specific. Well, specific. I think this is, riots, you got to admit, you got to admit this is important. You know, yeah, yeah. I think that the Capitol riots, he, he stirred all that up and it could have got a lot of people killed. They were going in there to kill. They were going to hang mine, Mike Pence. You know, I'm coming but, with you. I'm going to march with you. Really? He went into a bunker. He didn't march with anybody. Okay. You know, but uh, he didn't, he didn't say hang Mike Pence. He didn't say those words, but he alluded to it. Okay. Well, remember I was saying we're going to be specific. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're talking, we're not okay, talking was, about. He alluded to it. That's okay. The, but, and, but we're not one making. Fringe, one of these fringe QAnon people. May take that as 
let's go ahead. That they set up a noose and everything there. It was there. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, did he also not say, you know, march to the Capitol peacefully and protest? You know, did he I did say I peacefully? I didn't hear peacefully. Well, I've heard it. Okay. I've heard I believe, I'm not saying I'm not saying yeah. I disagree with you. Yeah. Here's the thing. What were they, I, were they were because he said that were they peaceful? Well, I mean a peaceful demonstration breaking into the what to the Capitol building while they're holding well, an election. Well, first and, of all, I, I don't I don't agree with the people who trespassed on the Capitol. I you know, I don't agree okay. with that. I okay. think I think that's a stupid thing to do that they shouldn't have done, and I wish they hadn't done it. I mean, but why do you think, think they? they did that, but why do you think they did that? I think there's a lot of non-thinking people in the world, and I think there's a lot of people who march until Trump told them to march. You know, well, come on. I mean, like it was most. You know, it was a protest. You know, I mean, there were protests. There were protests all summer. Do you think it was pre-planned? The I don't storm. Know breaking in to the cap. I mean, what are your thoughts on it though? Like when you saw I think, it, I don't know that it was pre-planned. I didn't really, I didn't like watch it as it was going on, you know, these guys it, with zip, zip ties and masks, you know, you thought they just had that in their truck and like, were they weren't thinking about it prior. Well, I mean, okay. And, okay. Well, for, okay. Well, okay. First of all, you know, there were tens of thousands of people there. Yeah. Right. So anytime there's tens of thousands of people somewhere protesting anything, there's always going to be, you know, there's always going to be that element of people who there are people out there who want to cause trouble. Right. Mm -hmm. No matter what their politics are, there's any number of people out there who want to cause trouble. We saw that, you know, I mean, the, I thought I thought it was a perfect uh, kind of dichotomy with what happened, what happened all summer, you know, like the summer of 2020. Look, look at all the protests where elements of the protest got out of control. And I mean, people were killed. You know, there was looting. There was burning. There was all I kinds of stuff. All that. You, do, you right. don't. Well, okay. So, all right. That. Yeah. So, you know, and, but there were, there, like, there was, um, you know, there was people right on the street. Literally, I, I live on Broadway and 10th in downtown mm -hmm. Santa Monica. Third Street, which is just a few blocks away, is where those giant protests, right, where they're looting, breaking the building, you know, setting shit on fire. Mm -hmm. Police cars overturned. Wrong. Yeah. Totally okay. wrong. Should never yeah, happen. Yeah, absolutely. I'm Compared talking about stand straw, like police brutality and all that stuff. As bad as what they did to, to George Martin or whatever the guys, should have never happened. Should never yeah. loot, should never steal. You know, that that's that's yeah. fucked up. Okay. So like I, I here's the thing. What happened on January sixth? I don't advocate. I wish it hadn't happened, you know. And I think anybody who anybody who breached the Capitol broke the law and should be arrested, you know. So yeah, I agree. And I've never heard anyone. I, I personally haven't heard anyone on the conservative side who doesn't take that position, you know, and I, I was angry at, at Trump for, I, even though I don't think he specifically was trying to achieve that outcome. I don't think that, but I think like a lot of things, he's, he's incautious with his words and listen, I voted for Trump in 2020, but I'm not some like, I don't worship the guy and I don't like the whole kind of worshipfulness that some people have for him. And I also don't like, I also don't like Trump derangement syndrome. Like I said, I don't, I, I'm not with the extremes of any, any political movement or any philosophy. I'm very much a you know, a person who tries to maintain balance, you know, a center point. Look, so, I, don't, I don't know Trump as a person and I don't think I have Trump deranged. I, Trump derangement can, syndrome. Yeah. From what I can what I've learned about this human being, if you mm -hmm. want to call it that, he's just not a very good human being in general. You know, that from what not, I, it may not yeah. be. And he was a terrible president, you know, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, and that's fine. Not, we not, yeah. 
Like, we can have that argument. I didn't vote for him in 2016 because I certainly didn't like him as a candidate. Right. Um, but when I look back at 2017, 2018, and 2019, you know, <laughs> I I kind of uh, I had to admit I was like, all right, well, he's certainly not my kind of candidate, and and I I you know he says any number of things or does any number of things that I don't like, but I think one thing he did was I think he exposed. You know, when we always talk about the the kind of a, the military industrial complex, I I think there's another complex, the uh, you know the media political complex, mm -hmm. and I think he exposed a lot of people for what they are. You know, like CNN flat out, as far as I'm concerned, they just became a, a propaganda network. You know, mm -hmm. that, I mean, they I just couldn't. I would see things that they would say that I just couldn't believe, like when when he was speaking at Mount Rushmore and the, the reporter for CNN talked about Trump speaking at a monument to two slaveholders, I'm like, okay, well, it wasn't a monument to slaveholders when Obama spoke there and waxed and waxed philosophical about the men represented in, in that monument and, right. or Bernie Sanders. Like, okay, the monument means what it means. It doesn't mean one thing when president Obama stands before it, and Bernie Sanders stands before it, and now it means a completely different thing when well, Trump speaks before it. So I think all these news outlets, Fox, CNN, M MSNBC, or whatever, when politics, the polit politics became a big talking point, shifted from being news to being like what you said, just uh, here's our stance, we're taking yeah. it, and we're going to try to, to feed. And that's that's the danger of it. You know, well, that's, people, yeah, I mean, watch the news and they believe what they hear. Well, the, 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 I think the, um, the, the, the television news, 24 hour television news, uh, model is dying because yes, of the that, internet. Yeah. And so they're trying, like anyone who's dying, they're trying to survive. And so they're surviving on generating outrage. All of them, mm -hmm. really. I mean, I tend more conservative, so most of the voices I hear on Fox News probably lean towards, you know, more towards, you know, my point of view. But, um, you know, MSN, MSNBC and CNN, you know, I mean, like the way they handled the Jesse Smollett, Jesse Smollett story and the and the uh, the the Covington kids story and, um, you know, and all those things. I'm just like, how would anybody watch this? You, you got to understand so, that when that first that story broke. Of course, you're going to believe it, you know, and then as it, the Jesse Smollett story, I believed it. I thought he got beat up and hung. By, but after I didn't believe it at all, I, I heard I heard a few details and was like, he's full of shit. Like, See, I, yeah, yeah, I didn't believe it at all because I, I know I know friends of mine that that's that kind of thing. Those things have happened to, you know. Well, yeah, those things, the things generally speaking that he described those things happen people get jumped people get beaten up you know for you know for all kinds of reasons but as soon as i started hearing more of the details and it didn't take long before i was hearing the details i was just like well i think that was with everybody me me included after four or five days yeah then he finally got exposed then I, I think he did the biggest disservice to the african-american community or or anybody uh that you yeah. could do yeah i mean it's Ever. like He's I mean, still was, he's still claiming he his innocence. He's, he's yeah. out of jail right now. He yeah, still, I know. In my opinion. Yeah. And he's uh, yeah. I mean, the damage he's doing is just I mean, like, is it could anybody doubt that he's just an absolute narcissist? You know, I mean, no, dude, no one believes you. No one. And we'll never believe him. Yeah. It's Again, like, like he had a chance. Yeah. He had a chance when he first got, I don't know, arrested and they let him, you know, like they let him go. He had a chance to to say, listen, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done this. You know, it was what it was, whatever. And people would have been willing to be forgiving. But um, but yeah, he, he, he in the first place. He doesn't. I mean, he's making nine hundred grand an episode on a hit TV show. He wanted more. <laughs> he wanted more. And, and he's like, a, yeah, I mean, being a being a victim these days, there's cachet in being a victim. You know? Right. 
I mean, look at and look at the way that people responded to to that whole thing. Uh, I remember, like, first of all, the the woman uh, Robin Roberts who interviewed him. I just like when I I didn't watch the entire interview, but what I saw of it was just like people are actually are there people out there who actually are buying this? I love how he said, you know, if I had said it had been a Muslim or said it had been a Mexican, you know, I'm thinking, why did you say if I had said it had been? You didn't say if it had been a Muslim who had attacked me or it had been a Mexican or it had been another black guy. He's like, if I had said it had been, it's like, okay. anyway, um, I didn't didn't watch that. I didn't get that involved in the in the story. But and um, and I think uh, the disservice to the. To, to, right. to any minority, any. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that story was just, and the way it was covered on the news, so many people in the, in the media, when it was saying he was allegedly attacked, I remember seeing footage of uh, somebody, I don't think it was The View, it was one of those other shows that's like The View, and she was getting, she was getting so angry at the word alleged, like, I can't believe they're saying this is an alleged crime, you know, it's like, Like you don't trust him because he's black or something. It's like, that's just, that's just the proper way to be when somebody you don't know makes an allegation like that. They're alleging something until it's actually proven, or at least to the greatest degree that you can prove something in a court of law or what have you. I mean, if I accuse somebody of doing something, I'm alleging that they did something to me, you know? Mm -hmm. And we've gotten to this whole point where it's like, if you fit a certain profile, a certain victim profile, you know, it's like, it's like the, it's like the whole believe all women thing, you know, believe, believe all women. It's like, wait a minute. It's like, just because you're female doesn't mean you're not capable of not telling the truth. And they say, well, we don't really literally mean believe all women. Is that then why do you say it? Don't say it. If you don't mean it, don't think, well, we're going to say believe all women, but don't you're silly if you think we actually mean that literally it's like then why are you saying it so right um anyway we've Agreed. we've gone we've gotten right. a little bit we've gone down a rabbit hole a little bit but just like <laughs> um but I it's just, cool you know i'm not screaming at you like i am aaron lewis because you actually <laughs> let me talk <laughs> I, well i i certainly i certainly hope that you felt that this has been a fair conversation a hundred percent good good because yeah. i would I really think that this is, I think that what we're doing is the key to the future. You know, it's like the world is complex. We see things different. I'll flat out tell you, man, most of my really close friends are hardcore staunch Republicans. Mm -hmm. Most of them, you know, the guy that financed hired gun, literally he's like a brother to me. I'd do anything for the guy. Mm -hmm. Uh, He did the same for me and we couldn't be any, we, I mean, we are just complete pull. I mean, he's a, He's one of those Trump people that just mm-hmm. love and breathe everything. He, he would keep when we talk, you know, Hey man, what are you doing? He goes, Oh, I'm thanking God this morning. I woke up and Trump is still our president. Jump on the <laughs> Trump. Train. That kind of shit. Okay. But we can needle each other. And we, you know, it's not like that. And we really, well, don't that's that much. And we're still, and overall he's, he's a great human being, you know, that's the just, way it just, should be. Yeah. You know, because first of all, guys do this anyway. This is how guys interact as they needle each other and they poke at each yeah. other, you know. And well, there's you know Mike, you know Mike Froge. Yeah, I'm trying to get him on. Yeah, so he was a, a staunch libertarian as well for a long time. And now he's more leaning towards the left, which mm-hmm. is surprising to me. Mm-hmm. I don't know what happened to the guy, but I'm kind of like, okay, wow. Yeah. Mike would be a great guest, but so would Aaron Lewis, you know. I think he'd be a great guest. I'm trying, I'm trying to get mike on i'd love to have aaron on although i i want to have people who i disagree with more than anything because to me no well, i think I, mean, I think mike now will be a good sparring partner because he's yeah. he's the tightest shifter i don't know if you know this or not he yeah yeah, yeah. i i i i mean i watch some of his i've seen some of what he says on facebook and uh you know i i kind of remember thinking well i thought you were more of a libertarian um, more of one he was so crazy like yeah like i'm like is this the same mike froge i know why, why are you saying such to me it was crazy yeah you know, back then especially yeah but uh but now man it's just kind of like are you bernie sanders now you know it's, right it's not, yeah 
you on that far, so it's funny. But he's a dear friend of mine too. Man, I love Mike Pro. You know, he's, yeah, he's. Great. I mean, I I do too. I mean, I, yeah. he's not somebody I'm close to, probably like you are. But we certainly yeah. know each other. We've certainly you know interacted. You know, he we've toured together and or played shows together. And I'll tell um, you straight out, man. I, you know, I know that we never really hung hung out. I just see you at shows or watch you perform or do photo right. shoots with you, but. They were always some of the fondest memories of my life, you know, that that era. I mean, to yeah. me, that we'll never get that again. And I no. you know, I miss the Metroplex, I miss Masquerade, I miss Stuck Mojo, I miss the Mayhem. Oh uh, yeah. And, and all that good stuff. But uh Yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's 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 kind of sad when I think back on it, you know, that like that time is that time has passed. Um it's so I tried, sad. it is. <laughs> It is. I mean, but I try to look at it as it's a part of life. It's something you just have to deal with, you know, and that's why I'm going to, I'm going to, whenever I kind of am sad about something like that, you know, if I kind of uh, bemoan my own circumstances, either financially, or if I'm like sad that I can't relive my youth and, and all those things. Um, the one thing I thank God about is the fact that I have a son seven he's my son's seven your son's grown but my son is seven my son is 31 years old yeah i know that's, that's amazing i mean and, and now that he's seven i'll tell you this when my son turned six so i don't know how this past year went but man at six years old it went by in an in a instant it yeah. really did yeah yeah like, i was like what it's, you know it's moving fast and that's why i wanted to you know spend more time with him and i'm i'm really thankful that you know, even though I miss so much about touring, of course, the playing show, you know, when the shows are good and, and all that stuff, I totally miss that. I'm not going to say I don't. But, you miss the other 23 hours, though? Not really. I, I'm not. <laughs> that's one of the that's one of the things, the, the perception. You know, I'm doing a new show now. Um, just so the audience know what, what, what else I'm doing. You know, I just finished a movie on, on Ray Parker Jr., the Ghostbuster guy, mm -hmm. who and now when people say that, because after this, you know, Hired Gun was very, very successful for me. It was in, in, and did a lot for me. And then I would bring Ray's in Hired Gun for two minutes. That's it. And I interviewed him for one day for like four hours. Mm -hmm. But He's a novelty celebrity because every, uh, everybody loves Ghostbusters, you know, and he not only wrote it, but he performed it. Right. I would bring him to film festivals with me and we'd sell them out just because of him. It wasn't because of me or my movie. Trust me. I mean, mm -hmm. people wanted to come see Ray Parker Jr. and do, do the Q&A after. Yeah. So we did it in Australia and I was fortunate enough to be able to bring him with me to Melbourne. And then we went to Sydney and did like they, they have their own Today Show. So in the morning we did that. Did mm -hmm. two or three screenings throughout the country. And it was on that flight that he told me the rest of the story. You know, I didn't know that if, he grew up in Detroit, but at 13 years old, he was doing sessions in Motown with the Funk Brothers, wow. you know, playing with Marvin Gaye, playing with Smokey Robinson, the Supremes, Gladys Knight. I'm like, what? He goes, oh, yeah. Then after that, man, he goes, I went to LA. No, he goes, before I even went to LA, I was 17 and I got a phone call from Stevie Wonder and I thought it was my friends pulling a trick on me and I hung up on him three mm -hmm. times until he starts playing the intro to superstition. I'm like, Oh my God, I've been hanging up on Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder <laughs> asked, <laughs> oh my God. Like, he goes, Hey man, you want to come to LA play on the talking book record? Then go on tour with the Rolling Stones. This was in 72. And he's like, yeah. So he does that, becomes a, and then learns from Stevie Wonder how to write songs and perform and everything else. Quits the Stevie Wonder band, moves to LA to be in the session world with the Steve Lukather's and J.R. Robinsons and David Foster's and all these guys. Mm -hmm. He goes, my my first real big session I got was with Bill Weathers because I played guitar on Lovely Day. Wow! And when he told me that, I'm like, man, tell tell me more. So we talked that whole flight, man. I'm like. I know what my next movie is going to be. Yeah. And everybody told me I was crazy. You're doing a movie on the Ghostbuster guy. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm doing a story on, on his life because it's amazing. That and is so awesome. Like, because like you said, everybody knows him. I mean, like, cause the average music fan probably doesn't know the name Ray Parker Jr. And if they do, they know him from Ghostbusters. Exactly. And, 
and to expose that aspect of his I mean the that all those stories. I mean, yeah, that's that's Correct. the no brain. Doing that movie is a no brainer. <laughs> yeah. So from that, you know, I started doing a, a Shania Twain approached me about doing her life story documentary, and uh, we, we got Lord, a Lord man. Shania yeah, yeah, yeah. Twain approached you about. Yeah, it, dude. When I say it, I'm not saying it like that. Trust me, because it was overwhelming to me because uh, I read up on her. You know, because I knew that she was going to be at this. We were in Switzerland and Zurich doing the festival for Ray's movie. And she happened to be there because she lives there. A lot of people don't know that she's a she full residency in, in Switzerland. And uh, her ex-husband, Mutt Lang, lives there. So they kind of share a studio together. If, if and, Shania Twain approached me to borrow a, <laughs> to borrow a pencil. I, I would, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she, you know, she was staying at the same hotel we were at. And I was there for two weeks. I wasn't just going to go there for the festival and go home. But her and her husband stayed at the same hotel for the whole time. They're just like, they wanted to get to know me a little bit better. And she approached me about doing the, the film and we started doing it. And then uh, kind of be careful what you wish for because, you know, she's an incredible artist and has a story that should surely be told. But I, I, had to, I backed out after about six months and I was just thought to myself, well, what am I going to do? Why, why'd you back out? Well, in the agreement that we like, we'd re signed the agreement, got the funding. It was the first thing I never had to go beg for money for. The money just flowed in because it's her story. It wasn't it nothing to do with me, it had everything to do with her story, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. And, um, but she had final cut over the film, mm -hmm. which in uh -huh. the documentary should never allow that to happen, but the financiers were okay with it. I was okay. I was like, look, she came to me for a reason because she likes the way I tell stories. And then she wanted to go watch Hired Gun the next day. And that's when she approached me. You know, she had, she actually sent me a text. Want to have lunch with me and Fred or breakfast with Fred and I? And Fred is her, uh, her husband. Uh -huh. And she's like, look, I think you're a really talented storyteller. You know, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm kind of tool around and find my next project. She goes, well, you're talking to it. Wow. I was like, I'm in. I called my, you know, one of my business partners and it's like, she wants to do it. I was like, yeah. She's like, the movie's fully funded, whatever you need. I was like, okay. And we got off to doing it. And then uh, we had a disagreement about personnel, mm -hmm. right? She, she had never done a documentary before. And the words, well, you've only done two document, two films mm -hmm. now. You're, you've been in songwriting situations. So I'm sure you're, you you know how hard it is to write a hit, one hit song. I don't have any idea how to write it. I mean, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's kind of like it's it's yeah. making a movie is one of the more difficult things in life. You know, because yeah. you have to come up with the idea, you have to execute it, you got to shoot it, you got to make sure the story's strong. Mm -hmm. you know, the editing, the music, the pacing. Oh yeah, that's that that's the easy part. Yeah. Then comes legal and clearing everything you need to clear because a lot of people think you just make a movie and put it out. Right. No, the first 80% is super easy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still hard, but in, in comparison to the last 20%, mm -hmm. getting legal cleared, all the music, the archives, getting your EO insurance, you know, errors and emissions. Because if you don't have that, a distributor won't even talk to you. And obtaining error and emissions, that take that's like closing on a house going into escrow, you know, mm -hmm. it's two months process and very expensive and then once you get all that done then you got to try to sell the thing and hope that god that anybody wants to see your movie you just spend a million and a half dollars on you know and yeah. do it twice is is tough especially doing it independently like i did you know yeah and that's you know, incredible Ray's, yeah so ray's movie got picked up by sony pictures because they also control the ghostbusters franchise so it was a no-brainer mm -hmm. for them yeah and a no-brainer for me i was like yeah, they gave me the best offer, and it was a generous one. And uh, they're going to do great things with it. And I think it comes out this summer. And that, and then, so you didn't have to with that. You didn't have to worry as much about some of the like the licensing and and stuff like that because they were, or is that just? I mean, they were the distributor. Uh, they were this. They're the distributor. Yeah, okay. I still had to pay through the net because a lot of Ray's music is controlled by Sony Publishing. Oh, okay. Publishing side, so I still had to pay for it, but he has control. Believe it or not because a great business and this is the thing about Ray and you know, and he doesn't really talk about it that much in the film, but his 
music attorney from day one. It was his very first client was Don Passman. Mm. Don Passman is the biggest music attorney on the planet Earth. And Ray was his first client. So they've been boys still to this day. They go to lunch once a week. Mm. <clears throat> Don Passman wrote up the contract for the Ghostbusters song. And if you remember back in the day, soundtracks weren't a thing. You know, it wasn't a big deal. Right. So he, he negotiated the deal where Ray owns the publishing and the master. Yeah. So he owns King Solomon's minds, basically. I mean, no, he does. Not basically. He does. Like, and yeah. if that doesn't fuck you up, you know, the, the fact that the, the amount of money he makes in the stock market is quadruple whatever he probably made in that because he was just smart. I mean, he had, he had people to teach him, you know, and I think that's another thing, you know, that, that yeah. we should, we should, you know, if I had uh, no so I shouldn't be so greedy and selfish and not like tell somebody, yeah, you should take 10% of wherever you make, just put it in the stock market, park it. The safest thing to invest in is Apple. Mm. Okay. They probably split 20 times now. If you know what split means, you know, that, yeah. that stock is probably $8,000 a share now because it's split so many times, but I think it's 150 bucks a share. Mm. That's a great place to just park your money. And just forget about it because it's going to bring you more money than any CD mutual fund, and it'll outpace the the, the inflation as well. Do but, they? Uh, um, I, I remember in the little bit of uh, the little bit of research I did in investing, I um, I came across something called uh, DRIPS, dividend reinvestment programs. Do you know much about that? I don't. Okay. No. no. Yeah. Apparently, it was the kind of thing where. Uh, you could like companies, and I don't know if they still do this. I read this a long time ago because you know companies pay dividends. You know, you buy stock, yeah. and the stock does well; it, it pays dividends. You could automatically, whatever the dividend they paid you, would just automatically rebuy more stock. You know, That's so smart, man. I tell yeah. you, it's a long game for me now. Yeah. Before I saw that money piling up, you know, that 35 grand turned into $157,000 quickly. Mm. And I was like, fuck, man. You know, and Ray's like, don't touch it, dude. He goes, I, I, he goes, I invested in Tesla 12 years ago. He goes, I bought 25,000 shares mm -hmm. for $24 a share. He got up to 3,000 a share. You might have to introduce me to whoever <laughs> held your hand, you know, and get Ray it. Parker Jr., man. He he's the the king of the stock market, man. He just he's got an intuition or something, you know. Mm -hmm. And and it's always been this way my whole career. If only five years prior had I done this, we're talking photography, filmmaking, anything, because it's like I'm five years behind on everything in my mind. Yeah. Was, yeah. Five years ago, I would have done this or. Well, that's one of the reasons I'm doing this now, because it's something that I've been thinking about for a long time. I mean, I have wanted to do what you and I are doing right now for years. Yeah. And one of the reasons I didn't do it was being in Fozzie because like, you know, you and I touched on some controversial things and I think we did it right. You know, we, we had a conversation, um, right. but I want to keep doing that. And, you know, like my opinions, I don't want to, I don't want anybody to suffer from my, viewpoint you know and when you're in a band you have to consider you know especially these days you know it's like i don't want to be responsible for somebody like chris getting canceled because the guy in his band said something controversial in a you know a podcast about politics right so that was one of the reasons why i never did it until now now i'm like i'm completely free and clear and Doesn't i'm assuming good, though, to like have that weight off your chest and you can talk Amazing. about what you want yes i mean Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's incredible. And I'm, I'm yeah. hoping that, you know, that it pays off at some point, you know, as you can see, I don't have any production value or anything like that. I'm um, in a great office, man. Yeah. Just... <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I've got a bed sheet, I've got a yeah. bed sheet behind me, but I'm, but yeah, but it's like, I'm excited because, you know, I've thought to myself for years, you should do that. One of these days, you're going to do this. One of these days, you're going to start painting you're going to start creating art one of these days you're going to have a podcast one of these days you're going to do this that and the other thing and i finally was just like man look at your gray hair if you don't just like if you don't just yeah. do it you know and i my my brother-in-law you know he looked at some of the paintings i was doing and i mean i'm no great shakes i'm doing the best i can i'm i'm you know 
I'm just creating what means something to me. But he told me, man, if you stick with it in five years, you're going to be doing really well. You know, That's the and thing, man. If, if somebody will have told me I came up with this idea for hired gun, you know, mm-hmm. heavily influenced by 20 feet from stardom, it's basically the same concept, you know, so right. the story of the unsung musician, you know, that plays for a pink or an Alice Cooper or a Billy Joel. Like I'm sure you know who Liberty DeVito is. Billy Joel. Oh, yes. So it's, it's forget the band, you know, it's about the story, the human condition and the, and the, in the human story, you know, yeah. and he's got a great one, man. And like Rudy, so any of these musicians, you're just kind of like, really, I did not know that, you know? So I, I kind of took what behind the music did. Mm-hmm. And that was the start of the floor and then went a little bit further and it's really mm-hmm. spiky. And, you know, then after the Shania thing, I was just going to say, you know, you, you think that your world is done, you know, and maybe, you know, I'm sure it was scary leaving a secure gig you have with Fozzie because you knew that every once in a while you're going to have this tour and there's going to be income coming in. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. I mean, it yeah, was scary. So, yeah. Yeah. So after this, after we pulled the plug on the Shania project, which was the biggest paycheck I ever got in my life, you know, but I wasn't happy because of some of the demands I was getting from her and management and other people. Mm-hmm. And it can crush your creativity. And I just wasn't, I wasn't into it. it just was to, at some point, if you want peace in your life, there's mm-hmm. no price on that, you know? And yeah. You have to follow your conscience. I mean, yeah. yeah. And, and I don't want to turn out a shitty product and, and she deserves to have a really good story told. It's just not going to be me telling it, you know, and I wish her nothing but the best, but the good news that happened out of it was uh, I got a cold email a week later from a gentleman and he goes, Hey man, thank you so much for making hired gun to me. It's the, the masterpiece of music documentaries. Please give me a call. Mm-hmm. No number attached guy's names there. Executive producer of Shits Creek. Oh, wow. One of the biggest shows on the planet. Yeah. My wife loves that show. Yeah. So I sent him a text and he's like, he was excited. Like he was a fan, you know, mm-hmm. freaking out. Cause I'm a fan of him. He's like, can you have breakfast this morning? I'm like, a hundred percent. Yeah. Let's yeah. Go. So we met at, believe it or not, Roscoe's waffles and chicken or whatever it's called. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've been there once. Yes. Yeah. 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 It was really good. So we, you know, then we took it and went somewhere and sat at a park and ate and sat, sat there for five or six hours. And he kind of told me his, his journey into being who he is. And the guy's just an enormous powerhouse in Hollywood and just one of the coolest people. But he's like, what are you doing now? I'm like, well, you know, I kind of told him the Shania's Taurus. I was like, I'm kind of hit the ground running. He goes, I loved hiring him, but I think there's more stories to be told. Have you ever thought about doing a docu-series on these great musicians? Perfect. I'm like, you know, the, I've already made that movie, mm-hmm. but, you know, I, and I know there's more stories, but I want to do it a little bit more modern because the people in Hired Gun, mm-hmm or metal because I only know metal people. Right. 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 Jason Newsteads and the Rudy Sarzos and, you know, probably the Billy Joel band was probably the non most non-mental and Ray and like Steve Lukather's in it. Mm -hmm. um, David Foster's in it. But other than that, it's it's pretty hard rock centric. And Mm -hmm. you know, the demographic for hard rock and heavy metal is not gigantic in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I set my sights out on it. So we partnered up and, um, you know, I've been, I've been, my eyes are red because I've been in here till midnight every night cutting together the, the pilot. But it's musicians that play with like the Lady Gaga's, the weekend, Jay Z, Beyonce, yeah, uh, Rihanna, you know, and these are, and it's called First Call is the name of the show. And I'm really excited about it. And uh, that's fantastic, man. I can't wait. Do you have a timeline for when that's going to be? Uh, well, you know, of course, it's just like making a record, but like right now we're writing the record. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. And then you got to sell it and you know, it'll probably be about a year before it comes out on whatever network is going to come out on, but we're definitely selling it as a series, you know, probably five, five episodes. And uh, okay. I got to tell you, man, these, and just like you, I'm sure you got an incredible backstory before you even became a drummer of some, everybody's got a great story, you know? And uh, I don't know. <laughs> and seriously. I mean, you got the call somehow, right? Yeah. You didn't I, call yeah. It. We're just lucky. I mean, you're a fucking kick-ass drummer. I've seen you many, many, many times. Oh, I'm like, man. This guy's Thank you. 
I expect, like in Mojo, man, I watch you play those those beats, and I'm like, how you know, he, first of all, it's almost a two hour show. Where does he get the stamina? <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's called being a lot younger than I am now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, Stuck Mojo would make for an interesting documentary. It really would, man. You know, I still keep in touch with Corey. Uh, yeah, quite a bit. Like it, the band that all the musicians know, but no one else. Does. You know what I mean? It's kind like, like yeah, it's kind of like Seven Dust, right? It's like all the bands froth over these guys, but it's like. Same thing with Mojo, you know. Yeah, well, you know, like never, never was on a major label, never had any radio, you know, yeah. like, and you know, the fact that how many years after the band effectively broke up, you know, the band that everybody knows, yeah. like, there's still people, you know, talking about it. It could be like a, it could be like the uh, the 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 Anvil movie, you know, yeah, the um, Star Park Brothers. Or any, yeah. any of that. Yeah, but, Spark, yeah, the Sparks movie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so. but, I mean, you guys were like live. You guys were devastating. Like I, I, any band that came after you, like, you just feel sorry for them. You know, that was the whole thing that, you know, we just I, I don't know where that comes from necessarily, because I, I certainly my personality, I don't have an aggressive personality at right. all. But once we got on stage and got I got behind the drums and the and the adrenaline, it's like that's where the aggression came from. And right. I just wanted to like, our whole thing was, I, we want to, we want to terrify like the other <laughs> bands. We want to terrify the, I mean, it was like, and yeah. not in a, but not in a, you know, not in a way like a band like Guar with effects or horror or anything like that. No, just, just a sheer presence of being, you know, I'm, I'm also doing a, a film on the history of the blues, which okay. nobody expect. And it all started, believe it or not, with a harmonica. Hmm. We only have rock and roll, rap, R and B because of the harmonica. Believe it or not, it all starts there. And I can't wait. To, yeah, I can't wait to show. But it's like right. back then, the guy that devastated and fucked everybody up was Howlin' Wolf. Mm. You know, yeah. and he was just this big, almost seven foot tall guy. The harmonica just he disappeared in his hand. He'd stick it in his mouth like a cigar and like crawl around. The, and he scared people. Like I, yeah. I interviewed. Billy Gibbons and he got to see him. He goes, Man, we used to go watch Helen Wolf because we wanted to be terrified, you know. <laughs> and he really scared the shit out of us to the point where, okay, this is cool, but now you're scaring me. Let's let's back away from the stage now, you know. And that's uh, awesome, man. Yeah, dude. I, 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 I'm certainly I mean, I I, I feel um I, I feel embarrassed to admit that I haven't seen Hired Gun yet, but that that's gonna uh, change to that's yeah. our that's our evening viewing tonight without a doubt and, it's a um, fun movie man it, t- it takes you a journey of what it takes to be a, a hired musician and the well, ups and the downs and the, the highs and lows i've seen the trailer and i i you know i'm certainly aware of it and i know i've said to myself man i've got to watch that sometime and i just never have but that's going to change tonight that's going to be our viewing tonight and um we're at like just under three hours man so uh yeah they went by in a flash man I know we're at we're at two minutes. Or we're at two hours and fifty seven minutes. So I think uh, my I think this might be a good place to wrap it up. But I cannot thank you enough for doing this, man. This is only my I was second. Excited when you told me you're going to start doing this, and um, always had you've helped me out in my career probably unknowingly. So I'm happy to help in any way I can. Well, dude, you've done so well for yourself, and your story your story is amazing as well. And, um, you know, if I have just been even a small part of your success, I mean, that just, I, I, I yeah, I can't, uh, I can't even, I, I don't even know what to say about that, man. I'm so happy for you. I'm so glad that you're, you know, you're doing well and, you know, I can't wait to see the Ray Parker Jr. movie. And, um, I hope you will do this with me again because three hours wasn't near enough. And, uh, I think we did, uh, I know we did exactly what I set out to do. I hope it was worth it for you. 20 plus years of trying to catch up, right? Yeah. Well, there's a lot to talk about. Well, let's, let's do it again. Shall we? Absolutely. And I can't wait to see some of your artwork. I'll purchase a piece to put here in the office. Just oh, let me man. know. Yeah. That would, that work. would be, a, that would be an absolute honor. So, all right, man, we're going to sign off and I will, uh, I'll talk to you soon, brother. Thanks Frank. All right. Take care, friend. Have a good one. You too. Bye.